Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition of the 605 Super Podcast. This being a very special edition, a tribute to the legendary Harley Race, who just passed away recently. I am the great Brian Last. It's my pleasure to be with you once again and joining me here today to talk about Harley Race, and we have a bunch of really great segments to play for you, is your friend and mine, you know him from Wrestling Observer Live, Mike Sempervivi. Mike, thanks for being here today. Hey, thank you for having me on. Uh, too bad it couldn't be under more uh, bright circumstances, but uh, in, in every dark cloud, there's a silver lining. And Harley Race's passing is very sad. It's an era of wrestling that is slowly but surely slipping away from all of us. But with his passing, we get now get to revel in what he did and what his life was about. And if there's anybody that lived a very full life from the time he came out of the womb, it was one Harley race uh, from beating polio to becoming NWA world heavyweight champion eight times uh, from everything in between and everything that came after a fantastic life and a fascinating man. And we're going to try to talk about as much of that as we can here today. Of course, he had such longevity in his career and he went to so many different places. We're not going to be able to touch on each and everything this week, but we're going to try to do an overall encapsulation on the career and the life of Harley Race. What we did was over the past week, I've had several conversations with a few friends of the show about Harley Race. You'll hear them here in a few moments. But we also went through the archives, the Arcadian Vanguard archives, as well as the 605 Super Podcast archives to find some great clips from the past featuring Harley Race, stories about Harley, anecdotes about Harley. So we're going to play those here today, too. And to start off this show, let's go back to the very beginning. Of course, Harley started wrestling at a very young age. He was driving Happy Humphrey around. That was his break into the wrestling business. He would later have a car accident. And a few years after that, break into the AWA. And that's really where his name first got noticed, in that tag team with Larry Hennig. And to talk about this period in his career... We had an opportunity to speak to our friend, the preeminent Minnesota wrestling historian, George Shire. Let's go to this conversation right now. As we look at the life and career of Harley Race, we're going to focus now on his early years and the first time he really gained great notoriety in the wrestling business. And to do that with us is the premier historian of Minneapolis and St. Paul Wrestling, the premier AWA historian himself, Mr. George Shire. George, thanks for being with us today. Brian, it's always a pleasure. And you know, after that introduction, I want to meet me. (laughs) We'll see. I (laughs) I hear you charge a lot for that personal appearance. We'll see what happens there. But uh, George, we're going to talk today about Harley Race. And I know that Harley is someone who, from his tag team run to the AWA, is a very, very special place in your heart. But before we talk about him in the AWA, What do you know about his early years? What do you know about the years leading up to his run in the AWA? Well, you know, a lot of people don't realize, Brian, that Harley started in the wrestling business at a very young age. He's born in 43, and there are carnival matches that I have in my results. You know, a lot of these uh, old wrestlers, they would work at the, the carnival shows that would go around, and they'd have the strong man and that sort of thing. And Harley was actually wrestling in some of these in 19, now listen to this, in 1958, 59, and 60. And he's born in 43. So you can do the math. Yeah. He was, he was only 15, 16, 17 years old. But he really got his start in the wrestling business when he hit about 20 years old. And his biggest backer was Gus Karras out of St. Joseph, Missouri. And Gus had been a, uh, not only a carnival uh, promoter, but he also promoted the wrestling, which was the big draw. And he took a loving for Harley race. Harley had gained a lot of his early wrestling training from the Zabisco brothers. And I can never pronounce their first names. Uh, <laughs> but you, you know who I, you Stan- know, who Stanislaus I and Vladek. Yeah, there you go, Stanislaus. And you said it better than I would have did it. So he did receive a lot of his legit training from them, but he received wrestling training for pro wrestling from Buddy Killer Austin, who was well-established in the wrestling business at that time, and a wrestler by the name of Ray Gordon. And also, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Bobby Hercules Graham put a lot of training into Harley race in those very early years. So he had some good background 
And of course, being in the Kansas City Central States area, pro wrestling was always a good draw. And that's basically where he started. But then he did go on to um, wrestle very briefly as Jack Long. And that was the name he used with a wrestler named John Long, Johnny Long. They were the Long brothers. And they wrestled together from December of 62 through May of 63. And at that time, Race ended up breaking the fibula in his leg. He was out of action. And it was Gus Karras who brought him back to Kansas City and said, you know, we're going to take a look at your leg. Because Harley told the story one time that they, they wanted to either amputate his leg or they said he'd never be able to wrestle again. And Gus Karras didn't want that to happen. So they had his own doctors or special doctors, and they got him. And whether that's wrestling lore or fact, it is part of the Harley race story. So Harley uh, ends up working, and it, it was Harley's own dad that gave Harley some good advice. He got irritated with him because Harley had been wrestling using the name of Jack Long, and Harley's dad told him, you know, what the hell are you doing? Use your own name. You got a great wrestling name, Harley Race. And the rest sunk in. With but some exception, Harley Race actually uh, wrestled. I don't think a lot of people know this. He wrestled for three matches in 1963, two in July, one in September. And it was in Kansas City. And on those cards, he was introduced as Danny race. How about that? He was also the great Mortimer that year. And that was for Jack Pfeffer booking for Fred Kohler, the dying days of the Chicago office. Yeah. You know, and that's a strange thing because, uh, you know, the great Mortimer and you look at there and we've got some programs or I've got some programs that show uh, Harley races picture on there. And that was a short stint too. It was only from July of 63 through September of 63 and, you know, Pfeffer was so good for that. He'd bring in guys, real wrestlers, and uh, give them some strange off-the-wall name as a knockoff of another wrestler and uh, pass them on as the real deal. You know, we, you and I, we laughed off air when we talked about uh, Nal- Neldo, Naldo Von Erich. That's right. And I, I told you that it was uh, Chris Markoff. Around this period of time, it seems like he really starts figuring out who he is in wrestling as Harley Race, and that's down in Texas. He gets his break in Kansas City, but it seems Texas is a place where he really finds himself and breaks out. Well, the thing about that time period in the early 60s, you know, the early couple years of the 60s, there were really a couple of really strong territories that a wrestler could go to, and you could make a lot of money. One of them, obviously, if you were in the AWA, Or you could go to Amarillo and work for the Funks because they had a good territory down there. And Texas as a state in general with, you know, I guess if you counted them, you had about four or five territories within the state itself where individual promoters ran their own promotion. But the Funks were the primary one. And Harley hit it off with uh, Dory Sr., Dory Jr., Terry almost immediately. And they, you know, they did take him under their wing as well. It's 64 where he gets his big break in the AWA. What led to it happening? He had a couple of matches in the AWA before he started as Larry Hennig's tag team partner, didn't he? Yeah, he did. You know, the funny thing is, is a lot of people, they always say, well, in the AWA, he only was uh, Hennig's partner. But when I look through the result, uh, Harley has literally hundreds of singles matches while in the AWA, aside from the Hennig tag team that, you know, went on for almost four years. And he basically wrestled all of the top names, the singles wrestlers that came through the territory during the 1964 to 1968 timeframe. And I mean, you're talking major names, Vern Gagne, of course, Harley had many title shots against Vern more so when he was getting ready to leave towards the end, he had a good run with Vern. And, but I mean, he wrestled against Cowboy Bill Watts and the Crusher and the Bruiser and Wilbur Snyder and Bob Ellis, uh, Ernie Ladd, Reggie Parks, Sailor Art Thomas, Johnny Powers, 
the Alaskan, I mean, pretty much everybody that was in the territory, Harley had singles matches with him. He had singles matches and really got over with mighty Igor, Dick Garza. And I mean, they had a good program together, but his tag team run was the primary focus. And a lot of these singles matches would come out of a result of a a disputed decision and a tag bout or something where the two guys wanted to settle it, that sort of thing. How did Harley get booked into the AWA and had he met Larry Hennig before he got booked into the AWA? Well, there's two stories there. One is the truth. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, the true story is that Harley was booked into Minneapolis through Bob Geigel in Kansas City or Gus Karras in Kansas City. And Vern was always using being close to Omaha and part of that promotion. There was an exchange of talent from time to time. And again, there were times when a lot of guys would just come into the AWA. And if you go and look at AWA results in general, you, you can be surprised at how many wrestlers that were in the territory, either before they ever made it big in the business, or they just popped in and popped out. One of them that may surprise people is Thunderbolt Patterson, who went on to a stellar career everywhere he wrestled. But he, he was wrestling in the AWA as Claude Patterson and doing jobs for about a year in 1964. And he and Harley Race you know, crossed paths many times during that, that first year of the Hannigan Race tag team. But going back to Race, he did show up, and it basically was just because he was coming in to make a few bucks. He came here in September of 1964, and he wrestled on TV, and then he had a singles match. And the, the true story of how he hooked up with Larry was Larry Hennig saw him wrestling. And it was about the last six or seven months before this that Larry had pretty much became becoming into a heel wrestler himself. And Larry wanted to have a partner. And so he basically asked, could we have, could I hook up with this young kid? And Harley at the time was 21 years old, 1964. Now Larry was uh, six years older Seven, Harley just died 76. He's 76, and Larry would have just turned 83. So I guess that makes him about seven years, right? Yeah. That was the difference. So Larry was the veteran on the team. The, the AWA immediately billed them as the youngest tag team, when the youngest tag team to ever win the tag title when they finally did. But here's how the AWA concocted their team. Larry Hennig, when he was down in Texas a few months earlier, and he had, he was wrestling for the for the uh, the Dallas group at the time, and when he came back up to Minnesota and Harley was here, they concocted the story for their getting together as they met in Texas, and they looked over the Texas sunset one night and declared to each other that they were going to become the greatest tag team ever in pro wrestling. And they had been together for a while. When they teamed up here, they'd already said they'd been together and they'd worked out their tank, their teaming together, and that they were going to be the greatest team ever and that they were going to be the champions. And that's the story that we got. But the reality was is that Harley really was asked to be Larry's partner. Of course, they would be given nicknames, Handsome Harley Race and Pretty Boy Larry Hennig. Larry Hennig would eventually become The Axe, a much more fitting name as he grew older. Harley would remain Handsome Harley Race pretty much throughout his entire career. Who gave them the nicknames? Where did the nicknames come from? Well, the, I, pretty much from Larry and Harley themselves because they, they took on, it's hard to believe this because Hennig and Race, and I tell you, I so wish there were films and, and tapes that were still available from that 60s era because they just don't exist. But Hennig and Race, though they played the somewhat, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, you'd say the feminine role to the crowd, they, and, and they would play, you know, they'd back away from an opponent and, and you know, kind of play the sissy role and that sort of thing. And then when the guy turns his back, they give him the cheap shots and that sort of thing. But 
they came up with the handsome Harley race. And then, you know, Larry had to have a name too. So it became pretty boy. The thing that really got them over was that on their interviews and their interviews, again, I so wish they, they still existed because Larry was the, you know, more the senior partner, though they never admitted that they were seven years apart. They always had them pretty much close together as far as the youngest uh, tag team. But Harley would come out and he would really irk the crowd because he would say, you know, I have the body of Hercules, the mind of Einstein, the face of the goddess of love. And I have the body that men fear and women crave. I mean, just doing that in that era. And then when you'd be at their matches live, you know, Larry would, uh, or Harley and both of them, they would poke fun at some guy sitting at ringside, sitting next to maybe his wife or his girlfriend, whatever it was. And he'd tell her, you know, wouldn't you rather be with me instead of that big fat guy next to you? That sort of thing. So they really gained the heat from the fans. And the thing that was unique about their tag team is that the AWA immediately gave them a monster push from October when they hooked up in 64. I think their actual match together, the first one was like September, September 25th of uh, 64. But from there until the end of the year, they were, they didn't lose. And they beat, you know, a handful of tag teams. They just couldn't be pinned. And they wanted to win the world tag team title. That was the big boast. Now, I know that when Larry Hennig passed away here a few months back, um, you and I, we talked about Larry and a little bit about Harley and how the team came about. But just to refresh, Crusher and Bruiser were tag team champions at the time that Hennig and Race were running for the title. And the Crusher had disappeared from the AWA because he had lost a loser leave the AWA match to Vern Gagne. Self-described as a, a vacation for the Crusher because he wanted time off. Okay, that's behind the scenes. So from August of 64 to the end of the year, there's no Crusher and there's no tag team title defenses. And the Bruiser, he's busy with Indianapolis doing his own wrestling and his own promotion. So the AWA didn't really have tag champions that were active. What they did was, is that in December of 65, they, Hennig and Race had been having a program against Reggie Parks and Vern Gagne. And in the third match against them, Wilbur Snyder was in town and he was on the card. And during the tag team match, he came out and he sat at ringside, just sat down. Well, you know, by then, as a fan, we realized, okay, something's going to happen here. Well, during the course of the match, Snyder indicates to the referee that Hennig and Race were cheating, doing this or doing that. And Hennig and Race got really frustrated. And they said, you know, if Snyder wants to stick his nose in our business, tell it, we'll get a tag team partner and he can join Gagne and Snyder or Gagne and Parks and we'll beat them all. So they had this little two-week mystery contest about who their partner was going to be. And finally, they announced Hennig and Race that our partner's going to be Dick the Bruiser, one half of the world tag team champions. Now, how are you going to beat that, Ganya Snyder, and Parks? Okay? And it's a huge deal. So they have the six-man tag in December of 65. And during the course of the match, and this went on for the entire two out of three falls, Hennig and Race will not tag in the bruiser in the match. They tag in and out to each other. And the bruiser, he's starting to get a little uh, anxious on the ring apron. He's prancing around. He tries to tag in. Every time he tries to come in, the referee pushes him out. You know, usual tag work in those days. So Hennig and Race finally uh, get the bruiser worked up, and he comes into the ring in the third fall, and he takes Hennig, takes Race, by the hair, rams their heads together, Race falls on the apron or on the mat, Hennig falls out of the ring, and Wilbur Snyder falls on Harley Race and pins him one, two, three, and the bruiser takes off. Well, Hennig and Race are irate. They call him a Benedict Arnold, this modern Judas, the whole thing. He double-crossed us, the whole thing, and they want a match with the bruiser. 
And the bruiser says, I am going to search every bar and every honky tonk, and I'm going to find the crusher and we're going to defend the title. So that was a beautiful setup to the clash with Hennigan race, getting the championship. Now you have to realize at this point that technically bruiser and crusher were still both heels because the crusher had left town as a heel. The bruiser came back still as a heel. And when they wrestled Hennigan race the first time, it was up to the fans. It was in January, the middle of January, like the 15th of January in Minneapolis. It was one of those things where the fans were a little like, who are we going to cheer for here? But naturally, Hennig and Race were able to win over and become the, the heels in the match. And the Bruiser and the Crusher were getting the cheers. At the end of the month, on January 30th, in a rematch, we don't need to go into what happened in the first one. It just ended up that the Crusher and the Bruiser ended up retaining the championship with some fluky stuff going on. But at the end of the month, Hennig and Race won the title. And they were off and running. They had beaten the Crusher and the Bruiser. Of course, the Bruiser's gone because he's back in Indianapolis. And then it was Crusher with various partners, and he wrestled Race in a singles match, and he wrestled uh, Hennig in a singles match. And, you know, they just continued the thing going for another year or so. But there was um, one incident right after Hennig and Race won the championship at the end of January, a couple weeks later in February, there was something that almost derailed the tag team. You want me to share that story? Well, let's talk about that story. We're talking about February of 1965. That is correct. We are talking about, I guess this happened in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, correct? Yes, it did. There was a, a nightclub in downtown Minneapolis called the Chestnut Tree Nightclub and Lounge. And a lot of the wrestlers used to go into this lounge after the matches and the wrestling office, the Minneapolis wrestling club was located just a couple blocks away in downtown Minneapolis. So it was familiar territory and they'd have the matches in Minneapolis at the auditorium. And then of course they could go over to this chestnut tree lounge. Well, Hennig race, Eddie Sharkey and Rene Goulet were at the nightclub together. Now, we should say they probably weren't together in the eyes of the fans because the the babies and the heels couldn't be in the same place at the same time in those days. But Goulet and Sharkey were in the building. During the course of the night, there were three guys that were uh, beating up on a lady inside the club, pushing her around, kind of shoving her and slapping her a little bit. And Harley Race stood up, went over, and literally knocked two of the guys out right away. Well, the third guy got Harley from behind, and he put a knife into Harley's shoulder blade. And Harley went down. He was taken to the hospital, spent the night. It made the morning papers that Harley Race, pro wrestler, was a hero, saved this woman. There was some talk in the newspaper at the time that perhaps the the woman had been a prostitute. But then again, we don't know that. It's just the way it was reported. But the bottom line was Harley came to her rescue. And so he was a hero. Well, on All-Star Wrestling, the following Saturday night, they play it up on TV that Harley Race went to this lady's rescue and he is out of action. And Harley was out of ring action for about a month. So he missed a month of bookings. And what they did was they had Larry Hennig team up with a masked guy who they just billed as, this is original, masked man. Larry Hennig and masked man. And this guy filled in for Harley Race. But they weren't defending the title. He was just filling uh, Harley's commitments. Well, the mask man was a veteran wrestler by the name of Tony Nero, who had wrestled under a mask previously, uh, different names. He was the black shadow on the East Coast, and he had various wrestling ring names. But he had been working for Vern at the time on some undercards, and they basically put a mask on him and didn't tell anybody, just billed him as mask man. So we go for about a month. Harley comes back to ring action. Now, 
if you ever saw Harley race at that at that point or 20 years, 30 years later, he always had that mark on his back where that little knife went in. And it was like a half moon that the scar was there. So Harley comes back. Oh, and they played this up in the papers, too, that the knife had went into Harley's back and it had become only inches from his heart. You know, and again, I don't know whether this is part of kayfabe or it's the way it was, but it was reported that way in the newspaper clippings. So when he comes back to All-Star Wrestling TV, his debut from this incident, he comes into the ring with Larry. They introduce Harley Race. And the studio audience stood up and clapped, giving him basically an ovation. And this was the beauty of Harley Race. He gets cheered. They rang the bell for the match on TV to start. And Harley Race took action for his team first. I'd have to look at the results to see who he was wrestling, but whoever it was, he just started pummeling the guy and kicking him and stomping him. And within about 15 seconds, Harley Race had that studio audience booing the heck out of him. And Harley said later, he said, I knew I had to get my heat back because I can't be a hero. And it was beautiful. So coming out of his return, what was that first year? As AWA Tag Team Champions, like, I know they would win them and they would lose them, but what was that first year as a tag team really like? And talk a little bit about some of the highlights. Well, you had you had a Golden Goose tag team here, that's for sure. They had um, they won the title at, uh, on, this, on January 30th of 65. And then in August, or in July of 65, they had a, a program against the Crusher. And remember I said Bruiser was gone and Crusher was using various partners to try to get back the title from Hannigan Race. Yeah. Well, he did the unlikely thing because he had now become basically very popular. And he did the unlikely thing where he asked Vern Gagne to be his partner. And then we had that great angle where can Vern trust the Crusher? Can the Crusher and Vern get along? Because they had, you know, two years before this, they were in each other's faces, Crusher being the heel. So that was a great combination. So what they did really to kind of keep it going was they had Ganya and Crusher win the title, and then Hennig and Race won it back right away two weeks later. So it really put the feud over, and then they had a few more matches against each other. So that was the first time they lost it and rewon it. Then. Um, they dropped it to the Crusher and the Bruiser in 1966. And when they lost it to the Crusher and the Bruiser, Hennigan Race went to Australia for a tour, Australia and New Zealand. And this was a legit deal. They were down there. I have all the results. And they had a couple of TV matches in Australia. And then they had a, an elimination match at the uh, arena. And they won the international tag team title over Mark Lewin and Dominic Danucci. And then a month later turned around and lost it to Lewin and Danucci and Hennigan race returned home. So during that month run, they went in and won a title and lost the title international title, then came back to the AWA. And then they got the tag team title back from the crusher and the bruiser in uh, the first part of 1967 and then kept it for the next uh, nine months until Hennig broke his leg in November of 67. And the Hennig team was, or the Hennig and race team was kind of shortened there because they were champs. The AWA let race pick Chris Markoff there. We mentioned him again. And I would point out that Chris Markoff at various times throughout the couple of years he was a regular third partner for Hennig and race when they were in six man matches during that time period, we had handsome Harley, pretty boy, Larry, and as crusher called him sweet lips, Christine for Chris Markoff. <laughs> he was the third Dolly sister crusher would say, but anyway, uh, race and Markoff were said to have been allowed to defend the title in Hennig's place. 
And in their very first defense on November 3rd of 67, they lost the title to uh, Wilbur Snyder and Pat O'Connor in Chicago. And that was the end of the Hennig and Race team up to that point. Now, Hennig was out of action for about six months. During that time, Harley had a a short run with hard-boiled Haggerty as his partner for oh, about a month, month and a half, all around the circuit. And then he had a series of singles matches against uh, Bill Watts and Big Luke Brown and title matches against Vern Gagne. So race was kept in the spotlight. In March of 68, when Larry Hennig came back, Larry and Harley were put back together. And for the next six months or so, they they were not being given the push that they had received before because Harley had already kind of indicated that he wanted to move on or he was getting restless. And Larry Hennig, it's ironic that I bring this up again. We were talking in November with Larry when I was with him on that uh, that brewery thing they did for naming a beer after him. And Larry said again that, Harley wanted to take the tag team on the road and let's go to some other territories. He even wanted to go back to New Zealand and that sort of stuff. And Larry didn't want to leave or wasn't fond about taking the the family and heading out. So the the story is pretty much uh, consistent because Harley said the same thing in his book that he did several years ago, that had Larry been willing to travel Maybe the Hannigan race team would have went on a lot longer and maybe Harley wouldn't have been headed to Kansas city and getting involved in the promotion and that sort of thing that he did. When you're looking at this period of time in the sixties and the AWA, how would you rank Harley race as an in-ring performer? Obviously there are guys that people talk about from this era as being the top guys, whether it's red Bastine or Ray Stevens, where would you put a young Harley race? Where would you rank him? Or how would you rank him as an in-ring wrestler? I would rank him very good because Harley was, he he was always the same Harley race that you saw even in later years. He had a more, uh, I always called it a methodical kind of, he wasn't the fastest mover in the ring. He, he seemed to be calculating what he was going to do next, but he had that ability even as the younger Harley race in the sixties to always when he was in, in and I'm amazed when I looked this morning, when I knew I was going to be talking to you, I glanced real quickly at all of his singles matches. And I mean, the guy was in main events all over the AWA for, for a good three year run up to and including getting title shots with Vern, not only at the end of the AWA run, but even during the, the three year time period. And so he drew well as a heel and then having a good uh, baby face opponent, you know, if you got the crusher or a Ganya or a cowboy Bill Watts or somebody as your, as your opponent, you know, obviously things should be good, but Harley, he really was, he could really get the fans to not like him. And I think I'd rate him. I'd rate him. Well, Brian, I really would. I always enjoyed him. You know, he was one of those guys that, I have a list of my favorite wrestlers. He's on the list. It's a moving target, but he's on the list. Was it disappointing that the AWA never got a Harley race, Larry Hennig feud? Well, and you know, they alluded to having one in 1982 or three, whatever it was. Um, And again, we'd have to go back and look at the the results, but Harley had come back in here during the, uh, promotional war with the WWF when they were going national and Harley had come in here and was managed very briefly by Bobby Heenan and Harley had, it was promoted as being the former NWA champion and AWA fans, you know, the, the longtime fans, they knew Harley race and those that followed through magazines, etc. And they had a match on TV where Harley race had attacked Kurt Hennig, Larry's son. And Larry came to his rescue. And there was an interview that they they played where Larry said, you know, if you want a piece of me, you're trying to end my boy's career, et cetera. You know, and I don't know what happened to you, Harley Race. But, you know, we were, ex- I was excited. Fans were excited. But Race was gone. You know, I don't know what happened. And uh, as you and I, we talked off air, 
Vern was involved as promoter here and Harley was involved in central States and they both owned a piece of St. Louis together. Yeah. You know, I think that this was, there was something that happened where Harley wasn't here, whether it was three days or what it was. Uh, but the hint was there, but the Hennigan race team did get together a little bit before that in Japan in the early eighties. And they were over there as a tag team and worked together their paths crossed in the 70s when they were down in Florida together, and they actually wrestled each other, but they never teamed together in Florida. And it was just one of those things. Uh, Harley was more a mainstay in Florida, and Larry was there more on a vacation type thing when the wrestlers would go down and wrestle for a few weeks. And, um, but they, they never, never formed their team down there. Being someone that saw him so early in his career, and when he was so young, what was your reaction when a few years later in 73, he had his first, albeit a very short, but his first run with the NWA World Championship? I wasn't surprised. I figured it was the guy that could do it. I really did. And, you know, in that era, it was uncommon for a wrestler to come into the business and immediately get a monster push and get a title right away or be put over immediately. Harley Race was a rare exception coming into the AWA. Now, had he been alone in those early couple years in 1964, 65, and just come in without Larry Hennig and without being the tag team, I don't know that he could have carried himself on his own at that point as a single strictly, but it's the old, uh, you know, you're in the right place at the right time scenario, and Hennig and him meshed together, and it worked, and he got over so well. And by 1968, when he and uh, Larry were finished with each other here in the AWA, and Harley was moving on, um, there was no doubt that Harley was as good a singles wrestler as he can be. And I saw him wrestling Vern, and Vern is not a guy, if you ever knew him as a wrestler, he wasn't somebody that was going to let you make him look bad. But he would make you look good. And their matches were great. That's all I can tell you. I, I was totally excited as a young fan when uh, Harley and Vern were going at it. And of course, I was a heel fan in those days, so I always wanted Harley to win. And then when he went off and a couple of years later beat Dory for the title in the NWA, I was very excited about it. I said, this is the guy, this is the man. But we didn't know what was going on behind the scenes there because, you know, I guess the master plan was always to put it on Briscoe. And then you can get into the politics with the Briscoes and the Funks and who you want to believe in that scenario, whether Dory was really hurt uh, when he didn't defend to Jack and dropped it to Harley because he didn't want to drop it to Jack. And then, that you know, Harley being just the interim – but that also showed promoters, too, because there isn't anybody out there that wouldn't tell you that for the two months, the two and a half months that, well, it was actually three months that uh, Harley had that title for the first run, he drew well wherever he defended it. And I think he, he showed the NWA that I'm going to be your guy, whatever time period it's going to be. But Harley always took the, took the, the approach that, I am in the promotion to do the best that I can. And I will always give 110% in the ring. And I can tell you, he's another one of those guys that I don't think I could ever say I saw Harley race in a bad match because Harley performed. Now here's the interesting thing. And I find this, I've always found this hard to believe. We know that Harley passed away of lung cancer just a few days ago. And Harley was a heavy smoker his whole career. And I always found it very interesting that a guy who smoked as much as he did could go night after night after night in one hour Broadway broadways against opponents during his championship years. And of course, even in his younger days, Larry, Larry said that to me when we talked last, he said, Larry always had a cigarette in his hand. That amazes me because I just don't think of somebody having the endurance that he did, but he did have that stamina in the ring to, to go an hour every night. George, as we wrap up this segment, you had a lot of great tag teams in the AWA. What's the legacy that pretty boy Larry Hennig and handsome Harley race leave behind? I think it's safe to say that 
for many, many years, the AWA is, has been or was considered to be a tag team territory. And I think it's safe to say that if you're ranking tag teams in the AWA's 30-year history, Hennig and Race probably rank as high on the list as they could get. It would be like Hennig and Race, Crusher and Bruiser, Bachwinkle and Stevens, the Vachon brothers. Those teams would be the premier tag teams. If you go into the 70s, you're going to throw the high flyers in there because they definitely ruled that, that sector. But those are your teams. And we had hundreds of tag teams and dozens and dozens of regular tag teams that came through the AWA or worked in the AWA. And I think Hennig and Race are probably, for the 60s, other than Crusher and Bruiser, I would say Hennig and Race are the, the team that everybody will and should remember. If you get to the 70s, then you're going to go to Bachwinkle and Stevens and, you know, that sort of thing, the high flyers. That, that's how it breaks down. One of the things you heard mentioned there by George Shire was Harley being stabbed in a restaurant in Minnesota. This is actually something we talked about previously here on the 605 Super Podcast on an episode of In the News with Jim Cornette, where Jim and myself look at classic wrestling newspaper articles. Let's go to this right now. Let's hear the newspaper coverage, as well as some of Jim Cornette's personal memories of Harley Race. Let's go to In the News with Jim Cornette talking about Harley Race being stabbed. This first story, Jim, is from the Star Tribune in Minneapolis, Minnesota, February 16th, 1965. Assault charge filed in stabbing of wrestler race. John Morton was charged with aggravated assault Monday after allegedly stabbing professional wrestler Harley Race in the back during a fight in a Minneapolis restaurant Friday. Race told police that he was eating in the Chestnut Tree, 1370 Nicolette Avenue, when three men entered the restaurant. Police said that one of the men, Jack LaRue, 25, 591 Dayton Avenue, St. Paul, struck a woman in the face. Race, who was alone, interrupted and told LaRue to leave the woman, Peggy Hayden, 22, alone. The wrestler returned to his table, but a waitress informed him that one of the men had a knife, police said. Race walked over to the men, and when LaRue <laughs> cursed him, the wrestler hit LaRue, knocking him unconscious, police said. Morton, 25, address unknown, then allegedly stabbed Race. The wrestler was taken to the hospital and released after being treated. Police arrested Morton as he and a companion, Kenneth Alexander, 26 of 3609 2nd Avenue South, were carrying LaRue from the restaurant. <laughs> Now, we always hear these stories, Jim, about the toughness of Harley Race. And here's an amazing example, because not only is he stabbed, but he's told there's a knife and he runs towards yeah. the knife. Well, no, I, I, can, I can see this situation. He saw this guy smack this girl and he went over and, hey, leave this woman alone, right? And blah, blah, blah. And there was some words and it, he went and sat back down and the waitress probably came over and said, Hey, one of them's got a knife. Oh, they do. Well, I'll take that fucking knife. And he just happened to knock the other one out first that didn't have the knife. But, uh, I can believe he just calmly got up, went back over there. Cause they were probably mouthing off and here you go. Now I had heard I don't know that that's the only time that Harley Race got stabbed uh, breaking up a beef in a restaurant. Uh, there may have been another one as well, but, um, uh, you know, that's he wasn't going to take any bullshit off any. And this was 1965. He was uh, not quite 30 at that point. Right. So uh, he was a uh, he was even younger and tougher than. <laughs> uh how many guys yeah. would do that, Jim? How many guys, you know, from that era, today is obviously a different world altogether, but in, let's say, the 80s even, how many guys, if they were in a restaurant by themselves and they saw a commotion like that, would actually get up and get involved? Uh, but, but, some of them. I mean, I can't just specifically call exact names, but, uh, you know, it, it, Buddy Rogers, didn't he make the papers a couple years before he died for taking some guy down in a diner or something and... and fucking him up that was trying to rob the place or b bothering people he was 71 or so i think at the time yeah 
you know, I, I mean, it obviously would depend on the the venue and the uh, the numbers, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised for a guy like Harley of three on one. He would do the old deal where he wanted to wait until a few more of them showed up to make it even. How much time did you ever get to spend around Harley? I know he was there briefly in 1990. I know he was there in 85, but that may have been before you got in there. Did you get to spend much time around Harley during your career? Um, well, it, just every once in a while, at, at you know, most recently over the past 20 years or however many years at fan fests and et cetera. But I mean, he was in Greensboro one night as a special attraction while we were yet had just got in for Crockett. And, uh, you know, it was just it was I mean, I didn't sit down and take up all of his time, uh, his his important you know, a boot lacing and cigarette smoking time to bend his ear like I would one of the boys that, you know, wouldn't knock me out. <laughs> but <laughs> but I remember, I, you know, in that night in Greensboro, we were sitting near each other in the locker room and, and he was talking about, I, I can't remember how it came up. He might have mentioned he had to have surgery on something in us. And I, it, he took my hand and put it on his kneecap. And that would sound, in anybody else but Harley, it would sound dirty but he put it on his kneecap it was like feeling a bone a, a bean bag his kneecap wasn't in like a bone it was like it was like it wasn't mushy it was hard pebbles of shit and his elbows were like pebbles of shit and i'm like what the fuck because uh, uh, he took all those bumps all those years he took them exactly squarely and perfectly but my god he used to take that full flat back body slam on concrete and, you know, uh, even as tough as he was, it, it, you know, fucked up a lot of shit in there. But I, I was amazed he could still walk and he was out there wrestling in one of the main events. I don't think I ever really truly appreciated Harley when I was younger until I saw the Mid-Atlantic tapes and I saw that match with him and Steamboat. Yeah. That really made me appreciate how when he was just a little bit younger than when I first saw him, how he was able to move around. Well, and see, I had first seen him. Right about the time of the Mid-Atlantic films that were shot in the late 70s. I saw him 77 uh, was the first time I saw him live when he got the NWA title. And going back then, and it was a big deal. I remember, obviously, at the time, I saw him in Memphis. And he came, he came to Louisville against Rocky Johnson, Memphis against Rocky Johnson. Then I finally got to see him uh, in Atlanta against Tommy Rich and et cetera. Over the couple of year period, right before he started slowing down in the 80s, right? But when I go back now and look at the notes that I made from those matches, it's always the same thing. Best match I've ever seen Rocky Johnson have. Best match I've ever seen. You know, best, it was him. And it, I wasn't quite familiar enough with his work to to know what to, you know, what to expect. But it was it was. And then his best stuff physically was in the late 60s, early 70s. That's why they considered him as the guy to go between uh, Funk and Briscoe to begin with, because he was one of the best workers in the world. George Shire recently was here on the show talking about just how good Harley Race and Larry Hennig were as a tag team. And unfortunately, there's very little, if any, footage of them together. Yeah, I don't know if I... It, it, I mean, there might be some real flickery 8 millimeter stuff out there, but I don't know if I've ever seen a videotape of Race and Hennig. Of course, Harley Race was in Minnesota early in his career, but so many people, whether it's early in his career or later in his career, think of Kansas City and the Kansas City office. Another place he wrestled was Iowa, and a young fan growing up in Iowa at the time was Tom Hankins. He would later break into the wrestling industry and wrestle in various places, but as a young fan in Iowa, he really enjoyed watching Harley Race, and he actually got to know him, and he got to also witness some really interesting stories when it comes to the toughness of Harley Race. Let's go to this conversation with Tom Hankins right now. We continue our look at the life and career of Harley Race now by welcoming back to the Super Podcast, Tom Hankins. Of course, the author of The Mat, The Mob, and The Music, a fine book on Crowbar Press. Tom, glad to have you back on the show today. Glad to be here. Sorry it's not under better circumstances, but... But still, we're going to get to pay tribute to someone who certainly deserves it, and that is Harley Race. And the reason I asked you to be on this show was I know that not just through being a wrestler, but through some of the interactions you had with Harley Race, you got to know him a little bit. And I wanted you to share those stories with the listeners today. Okay, well, I'd be glad to. I first met Harley when I was 21 in 1970 in Waterloo, Iowa. And that was right after he came back to the Central States after where well, I worked Amarillo after he'd been in AWA and he came into the Central 
face and bought into the promotion. And Dan Daniels, my light tag team partner, and I introduced ourselves to Harley and pretty much became immediate friends with him. We kind of stalked him and bugged him, but he knew that we were smart to the business, that we still had a lot to learn. But he taught us everything that we didn't already know. He said, when you shake hands, said, don't shake hands any harder than when you'd, what you'd hit him. And uh, years later, I was shaking Mike York's hand. He said, oh, you know, that's the perfect handshake. And I said, well, you can thank Harley Race for that. And he graciously taught us everything we didn't already know. He saw us more than just a couple of fans. It took us to the promoter, Gus Karras, to help get us into their business. And while Harley had never gotten the ring to train with us, but he watched us a lot of times. He was working out in the Cedar Rapids ring, which was a boxing ring with no padding, and it was harder than hell. But we didn't care. We worked out there, and Harley worked many matches there in our ring. He'd give us tips and advice when he saw how serious we were. I'm still grateful to this day for his generosity in getting us in the door of professional wrestling. He and Gus Kerr sent us to work for Nick Goulas, the same promotion where he started as Jack Long. And he and Gus told Goulas that we'd been working the Central States Territory, but actually Dan had only had one match with Ronnie Etchison in Waterloo previously when Bob Backlund no-showed. Why do you think Harley took an interest in you and Dan and helped you guys out? Was it because you guys were local? Was it because, like you said, that he picked up that you were a little smarter than the average person trying to break in? Why do you think he was so into helping you guys out? Well, we badgered him and the local promoter, Frosty Miller. We badgered him until he actually saw how serious we were, and then he just became friends with us and introduced us to Gus Karras. And Gus liked us right away. He said we reminded him of the Funk Brothers, not in our wrestling, but in our knowledge of the business and everything. And that helped us out a lot. And he just uh, picked up on that and became friends with us. What was the scene like at that period of time in Iowa? The Kansas City office was running the Iowa towns? Ah, uh, yes. Every now and then, Ganya would send somebody down to work, but very rarely he was basically all Kansas City. And they hated working in Iowa because it was a long drive, and they never sold out except once because of Harley. And uh, they hated the drive, but Harley didn't mind it because he loved to go pheasant hunting. So he'd come up there early in the day, go pheasant hunting all day, and come in and eat a huge couple buckets of fried chicken at KFC before his match. They'd go out and wrestle 60 minutes after eating that. I didn't see, I've never seen any other wrestlers do that outside of, uh, Katsumi Fujinami. And most of the wrestlers waited until after we were done working to eat. But how I could eat and go on the ring and put on a perfect match. By the time you're seeing him here at this period of time, he had worked for a few years in the AWA, just come back from another run in Texas. How good was he at this period of time? We know there's so much footage of him from the mid seventies on. Here in the late 60s, just how good was he? He was great. He was as good as he ever was. I guess he probably got better, but he was, he was great. He could carry anybody. He carried Rufus R. Jones, Danny Little Bear, the Viking. He could carry them all to good matches, whereas they couldn't have good matches otherwise. And I saw him go I think, to a 60-minute draw with Rufus R. Jones, and that had to be a lot of work. But Harley did it and made it look good. Did Harley ever talk to you or Dan about what he was thinking, what he was doing, what he was trying to do at that point in his career in the wrestling business? Well, yeah, one night in Waterloo, we were actually, he was having dinner in this cafe and we saw him in there. So we went in to talk to him. He told us to sit down. He was glad to see us. And he laid out, he actually laid out a plan he had. He told us that he planned to secure the NWA title. He said he had to work in St. Louis on nearly every show. And Sam Musnick, was, the promoter, was basically the deciding factor in who was worthy of holding the title. It had to be somebody who was tough and could really defend it. And Harley proved his worth and his toughness as a wrestler and was indeed worthy of defending the strap. He also said it was important to wrestle in Japan as well. He said he bought into the Central States promotion so he could work in St. Louis all the time. I was surprised that he actually shared his plan with us, but I still remember it today just like he told me yesterday. 
did you ever actually have an opportunity to work with Harley either in the ring as an opponent or a partner? Uh, not really. He would watch us work out, watch Dan and I work out all the time and give us advice, but he never got in the ring with us. But he'd tell us, so he's continued to smarten us up and tell us things we didn't already know. And, uh, I was in an angle with him though in St. Louis. I was wrestling Jack Briscoe on TV and the angle was Harley would come out after Briscoe drop kicked me out of the ring come out and act like he was conspiring with me and briscoe got out of the ring getting a fight with harley and i attacked briscoe from behind knocked him down to the floor and got back in the ring and that was really the only time i really actually worked with him but it was an honor just to do that to be part of that uh set up for the world title match in st louis tom we hear so many stories about his legendary toughness Anything you witnessed? Do you have any personal stories about the toughness of Harley Race? Oh, yeah. I mean, geez. One night in Cedar Rapids, he bounced off, bouncing off the ropes, crisscross, and the top rope broke. Harley went flying out to the floor head first. Most of us guys would have been knocked out. I went over to see if he was hurt, and so did the referee, Bobby Whitlock. And Harley opened his eyes, looked at Whitlock, and said, Get in the ring and start counting to 20, you fucker. And Whitlock did start counting to 20. Harley made it back to the ring and finished the match with only two ropes. Uh, another night in Waterloo, I got into a bar fight with the entire bar jumping me, knocking me out. <laughs> I came to, and Har Harley and Dan were carrying me out the door, and I yelled something at one of the guys that uh, started the fight with me. And uh, he came charging at us, and Harley, while he was still holding me with his right arm, gave the guy the left right to the nose, broke the guy's nose, and knocked him out. Another time in Waterloo, he and Baron Von Roschke just won a match were on the way back to the dressing room when a fan grabbed the bell and hit Harley on the back of the head with the bell. And I owned that bell, and it was made from a switch engine bell from the railroad mounted on an inch thick pine board, and it was probably weighed 15, 20 pounds. He hit Harley as hard as he could with that bell, and Dan grabbed the guy's arms after that. And Harley turned around, punched him one punch to the face, broke his jaw, knocked him out. He was out cold for two days and made the newspapers and the TV news. And the next night in Cedar Rapids, they were running again. That's the only time they ever sold out Cedar Rapids. Everybody came to see this Sahari race. They wanted to see this guy that knocked this guy out and put him into the concussion. And although I think most of them knew who he was anyway, but everybody showed up and they actually had a turn away crowd for the only time I can remember in 20 years there. He was a definitely tough guy. And there's the story of him in Minneapolis, of course, getting stabbed and beating the guy. Well, Tom, when you look back on Harley Race, how are you going to personally remember him? What's your best personal memory of Harley? I think sitting down at dinner with him when he went over his plans with us, he kind of just laid him out what he was going to do to get the title, get the NWA title. And I'll never forget that. I mean, I saw him in so many great matches that I can't pick just one. I'd go to see him in St. Louis and Kansas City and then Iowa, of course. And I saw him against you know, all the top opponents. I saw him and Dory Funk Jr. go to an hour draw in Waterloo. So they came back the next time with no time limit or 90 minute, nine, not no time limit, it was 90 minute time limit. And they went about 70 minutes into double count out and fought all the way back to the dressing room. And I'll never forget that because that's a long time to work. You got to be in great shape. And Harley was, you know, he may not have looked like it. He was definitely in great shape and tough and he could go forever. Another person who goes back to the very beginning of Harley's career in 1963 in Kansas City, as well as the very end, he was someone doing seminars with Harley just a few years ago. That is Les Thatcher. Of course, the longtime voice of Southeastern Wrestling in Knoxville. Les has done everything in the wrestling industry. And one of the things, of course, he did that he's proud of was become friends with the legendary Harley race. Let's go to this conversation right now with Les. This is going to touch on various areas of Harley's career, as well as some of the stories we've heard. Harley Race and Vince McMahon, what exactly happened? Well, Les heard this story directly from Harley Race himself, so we could hear that and so much more. Let's go to this segment right now with Les Thatcher. 
We continue our look at the life and career of Harley Race today on the show by welcoming back a good friend of the Super Podcast, none other than Les Thatcher. Les, thanks for being here today. Hey, it's my pleasure, Brian. Of course, it could be under greater or better circumstances uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the industry uh, lost a hell of a champion, a hell of a, a performer, and a guy who made a big mark. In it. But then I lost a, a personal friend of many years as well. So it, it hasn't been a great week for me either. Well, let's go back to the beginning because so many people know him as being this legendary NWA champion, but you actually knew him very early in his career. Did you encounter him before 63 or would it have been 63 in Kansas City when you first met Harley? 63 in Kansas City. Uh, he was 19 and I was 22. And uh, I remember his birthday because his birthday is, uh, my wife's is, is uh, April the 26th is, and Harley's is as well. Uh, they were born on the same day, just with different mothers in different places. But, uh, yeah, uh, we met in 63 the first time and, uh, hell we, you know, our paths kept crossing from that point forward and, uh, we hit it off. I mean, Harley, you know, everybody knows that he's a man's man, toughest, maybe the toughest champion ever to wear the belt. Uh, I knew that guy too. I knew that badass, but I also knew this teddy bear and you know i've said to people i we were uh, my wife and i were blessed to have been uh guest in he and bj his uh his wife's home uh you know we we stayed there with them they stayed at our home in, in ohio when when they came up there to do uh camps uh but to sit and watch harley harley had a little mexican hairless little chihuahua and that little sucker would get up in Harley's big easy chair and, and hunker down between the arm of that chair and, and Harley. And Harley would sit there. And str- and, and it was I, – I, I thought, you know, if the people could see how he treats his dog. So he's so gentle and so caring with this little dog. I said, you know, they, they wouldn't think it was the same man. Not at all. But it was. Believe me. When we go back to the beginning in 63 – So many of us, like I said, we were used to a Harley race that we saw either in the 70s or the 80s. What was a young Harley race like in the ring? Was he similar to the wrestler he would be later on? Was he a brawler? What was a young Harley race like in the ring? He was he was a brawler, but, you know, he uh, he he worked holes. And uh, uh, I remember, you know, we worked singles there somewhere in in all my memorabilia. I've got it from a Kansas City program, a picture of Harley uh, getting ready to do a knee drop on me off the top rope in in Kansas City, uh, Kansas. So we used to run in there on Thursday nights. But, yeah, he was um, but deadly serious about the industry. But, of course, you got to realize, Brian, back then, all of us young guys who wanted to make it, you, you either were serious or you got run over or got pushed out of the way, one of the two. You know, I mean, it wasn't a game and it wasn't your hobby or it wasn't something you took lightly. Uh, you were allowed into a fraternity that was a closed shop. And so Harley was very serious. And uh, But he was, he was a talent. You know, it's funny. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with him early in a career, Pat Patterson. Uh, Bobby Heenan, before Bobby ever became a manager, uh, you know, uh, I'm, he carried jackets in Indianapolis and then later, you know, started uh, working some in ring. So I've been, you know, I've been around so long. I've been around all these, a lot of these guys when they were first getting started. And uh, it was a whole different time, obviously. But Harley was a serious student of our business. And uh, he took the business. I mean, uh, he you could have fun with Harley. But it wasn't going to be uh, in, in planning of a match or, you know, uh, anything like that. Business was first, last, and always the primary focus when, it, when you were in that dressing room or, you know, uh, when it came to being around the business. Uh, and he was as serious as a toothache. Harley was very young at that period of time. Did Gus Karras take a special interest in him? You know, I, I, yeah, Gus, Gus was a nice guy, too. Of course, Gus... Uh, lived in St. Joe, Missouri, and and promoted St. Joe, and actually started promoting in that area, and then you know became partners with Bob Geigel and Pat O'Connor, and then later Harley became you know part of that promotion as well. But uh, yeah, you know, and I, I think Gus Gus had an eye for talent. If you stop and think, Joe Hamilton, you know, one of the original assassins, uh, came up through the the, the ranks there. Uh, 
Ronnie Etchison, Sonny Myers. So Gus had a hell of an eye for talent. And if you understood our business and you had the opportunity to get in the ring with a a 19-year-old Harley Race, you realize that experience-wise, he he was – uh, you you wouldn't think he was 19 years old. You would you would have thought, hey, this guy's been around a while. Of course, he had because what he was 15, I think, when he started in the business. But you know, so he had been around basically for uh, four or five years at the time. And uh, but he worked more like a, a an older older veteran, and it wasn't a problem. You know, by, uh, obviously, most of the time your heels lead. And I guess there could have been a reason for me to lead if I'd asked to or wanted to, but there was never a reason for that. Harley knew what we were doing, when we were going to do it. And uh, he was a hell of a ring general. Uh, He really was. Who was it? Somebody just here recently uh, in the last week or so was mentioning that very same thing that uh, they worked with Harley when they were young and were nervous and scared. And Harley walked them through a match. Just as easy as possible. I say, you know, that mean, tough, uh, scrap iron guy that that everybody talks about. There, that was real. But there was the other side of Harley, the the humane side, the uh, the gentleman. Uh, the you know, he wasn't a loud guy. Uh, and but if, if he if you were his friend, if, if he had respect for you, you knew that, and. Uh, you know, Harley was a guy you wanted to be respected by. I mean, that wasn't so much, I don't think, in 63, but then as as we both grew and had the opportunity to cross paths later, you know, through the years, when I realized that Harley uh, respected me as an in-ring performer and as a trainer, that was good. I mean, that was like being handed an award, Brian, because here was one of the best ever, and he's saying, you're good. I'll never forget uh, when they uh, he got the ring uh, from the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, uh, not the WWE, but uh, the other one. And I remember he said, looked at me, he said, you're going to get one of these because you deserve it. And you know what? I may never. But if Harley Race said I deserved it, by God, I believe I did, Brian. So here early in his career, 63, between here and... I guess 10 years later in 73, when you would have been in the Georgia office, did you encounter him much when he was in the AWA or working in West Texas, or did you not see him until years later in Atlanta? It was years later in Atlanta, and and then, of course, as a champion, you know, he came through here, through Knoxville. Uh, You know, I I, I worked in the office in Charlotte, worked in the office in Atlanta, worked in the office here. And uh, so, I, you know, I encountered him. Uh, as a champion, you know, on, on his run through any of these, these particular territories. Uh, I, I know I posted a picture from, I think it was 79 here in Knoxville, uh, a picture of Harley and I at the, uh, Knoxville Civic Coliseum. It was a Thanksgiving night. He was right. Uh, this was, uh, during the war that you, you've covered so beautifully, you know, on Ron's show and, and Jimmy's and, and the times we've had together. Um, uh, but it was, uh, Harley defending the title against Dickie Slater. And uh, Don Curtis was our uh, commissioner of record at the time. And Don did come into town from time to time to, you know, to oversee things and, uh, you know, to actually, you know, show that there was a legitimately a, came, a commissioner for Southeastern Wrestling. And so Don and his uh, Dottie and their their daughters, who were just young at the time, uh, came flew up from Jacksonville and Dottie brought a turkey from Jacksonville. So, and after that, uh, Thanksgiving show, we came back to my apartment, uh, Don, Dottie and their, their daughters, Harley and I, and that's where we had Thanksgiving dinner. So, uh, you know, little things like that popped up, uh, since Harley's passing and you see those things and, and, uh, I savor them. Uh, I truly do. And my time with Harley, uh, never mind in the ring or as a trainer, but, um, just as two human beings, like I say, he was, uh, he and his wife are guests in our home and us and theirs, and uh, I'm proud of that and, and, and proud to say, I've, you know, I've been able to work with him and be his friend. We did a lot of things first together in recent years. Uh, he and I came up, we started doing the training camps at Cauliflower Alley. We did four years of those training camps um, together. Uh, the first NOAA week-long tryout camps when Harley was living in Eldon and had his school there. 
uh, the first couple of years, you know, I was part of those steamboat and I and Harley worked together that first year and um, which brought us around to, you know, the EPW, the elite pro wrestling training, doing the doing the training manual. And as far as I know, the three of us were the first guys to do multi-day uh, camps, training camps for independent promotions. So um, we forged <laughs> a couple of fronts <laughs> together, and uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm proud of that. And, and that manual, by the way, you know, that thing's out of print, and it pops up on eBay and Amazon occasionally. And I've seen the thing priced at 400 bucks a pop. Wow. And Alex Marzvez says, "Where can we get a reprint?" On those? <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Absolutely, at 400 bucks a pop, I wish I had a, a couple cases of those suckers." Did Harley enjoy working with young wrestlers? Because, you know, in, in a lot of other sports, the biggest stars don't always make good coaches, don't always want to coach. So here's Harley Race, world traveler, one of the great world champions of all time. Did he enjoy working with young wrestlers? Yes. I, I think something that – that was one of the things, I think, with uh, Harley, Steamer, and myself, uh, the one thing – you know, if a young guy had, had that drive and passion and desire, and he showed you that he was given everything that he had to give, you wanted to spend time with him. You wanted to work with him. But if you, you know, wanted to come across as though you knew more than we did or Harley did, then um, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time because he wouldn't, he wouldn't tolerate that, and he shouldn't. But yes, he, but, but he was a disciplinarian. Uh, I know at that first year, that first camp, we were down to the last day and trying to decide who was going to be picked, you know, to take the shot at Noah. And there was this young man. Uh, and, and the deal was we were adamant about we were having these five minute matches. And if the referee gets to four, you better break on the ropes because five is a disqualification. You, the, you're not going to middle the referee or put heat on the referee. So this last day, we're going through these things. And this one kid who we had, you know, kind of considered uh, in the, say, the top five or six that, you know, we were going to uh, break it down from, uh, got in one of these matches. And like two minutes in, he paid no attention to the referee. And the referee hit five and called for the bell. And the kid looked around and said, I'm not done yet. And Harley said, yes, you are. Uh, n no, you're done because you're not paying attention to what you were told. Get out of the ring. And this young man was, that was the end of his being considered right there. So you realize too, you know, that our generation detail, I mean, the people we work with, the, the, the workers that we had the opportunity to work with, the bookers that we work with, everybody had an eye for detail. So your facial expressions had to match what you were selling or weren't selling for that matter, or your injury or, you know, whatever it happened to be. And, uh, the thing with the referee, you know, you just, you didn't ignore the referees back then. You didn't do 10 punches, which means your referee could have counted to five twice. That it, it wasn't going to happen. And and that's part of the thing that we brought to the table in, in these NOAA camps in the initial first couple of years. And uh, it was the right way or not at all. And that's the way I, I, that first camp we did in CAC. Now it's the first time that uh, Harley and I had worked together. And I don't forget that first day we were having kids get in and, and you ask, how long, you know, how long you've been doing this? And it's, it was early in the first day. And so I, I've been in the business five years. And so we had, I forget what the drill was, whatever we had them do in the ring. And they'd been in there about a minute and a half and Harley leaned over to me. He said, that kid say five years or five minutes. <laughs> I said, I, I said, he said five years, but I think he meant five minutes. I thought so too, Harley said. <laughs> What's the end of it? But you know what? He was the kind of man, Brian, that if you earned praise, you you knew you had earned it. It wasn't like he didn't come around patting you on the back and telling you how great you were if you weren't. I mean, he wasn't. He didn't necessarily belittle you unless you put yourself in a position to be chastised or, or corrected. But uh, if if he said you you know you were good at that or you did really well at this. You know, you, you you knew that it was sincere. A young man that uh, tr had trained with me for a long time and uh, started a school at Denver, uh, Jeff McAllis, uh, who was serious, he came to that first year, that first camp that we did, and Harley fell in love with him. And I'll never forget, I mean, with his, you know, his basics and, and how he handled himself in the ring. And I, I remember Jeff saying he, you know, 
uh, well, he sent me uh, when Harley passed away last week. Uh, Jeff called me and, and was telling me, he said, you know, remembering that first Noah camp and, and work with Harley. Of course, he'd worked with Harley. And, and we went out to uh, Denver and did a, uh, a camp for Jeff out there, too. But he was so adamant how uh, if he never did anything else in his life, uh, the fact that he got to train with Harley Race and he could call Harley a friend was paramount to his uh, career, uh, however big or small it might have been. And I, I think people that understood Harley and spent actually spent time with him realized that that's one thing that you don't hear people talking about, his sincerity. And he was absolutely sincere. I'm sure somebody's throwing the, the whole thing about, um, you know, Vince inviting him at BJ to up there and want him to jump ship with the belt, and Harley wouldn't do it. And uh, that was as much his uh, appreciation of that belt and of the National Wrestling Alliance and what it had done for him and what it meant to him as as anything else. Had you heard that story from Harley? Yes. You mean, did he really drop Vince? Yeah. Yeah. So, So the story is, just so the listeners are fully aware what we're talking about, shortly before Starcade 83, Vince McMahon, who's already beginning to make his national expansion, approaches Harley Race and says, I want you to jump to the World Wrestling Federation with the NWA belt. And I want you to, you know, you would presume lose in a unification match, even though the belt would instantly lose NWA affiliation, to Hulk Hogan. And the story always was that Harley turned it down, and that's where things get what really happened after that point. Different people have said that there was a fight, that Vince tried to fight Harley that Vince actually was the one who started the fight. What did Harley actually say about the incident? All that Harley said is that Vince had made a move on him. I, and I didn't push him for, you know, for details. I don't even know how it came up. You know, it was in a conversation at his home. And that uh, from the, again, like I say, I didn't push for details, but it came out of Harley's mouth that uh, there was an altercation. Vince tried to take him down or tried to, take a shot at him and Harley took him down, knocked him down. <laughs> and somebody said, you know that for sure? I said, I know this for sure. I, I said, Harley told me that. And if Harley told me, I'm, I've never known him to make things like that up. So as far as I know, it's, it's factual. That's one of the things about Harley. He had a reputation as someone who could handle himself, someone who was tough. Let's go back to 73. You're in the Georgia office, Les. Do you remember when everything went down? It was supposed to be Dory Funk Jr. dropping the title to Jack Briscoe. Then there's a mysterious tractor accident on Dory Sr.'s ranch. And Dory Jr. comes back and drops it to Harley Race. Was the story that they put Harley in there because they knew there would be no shenanigans from the Funks? I believe so. Uh, I, I truly believe that. I don't know that to be a fact. It's not something Harley and I ever discussed. But during that time, that was a story that I heard as well. And uh, I don't know that, you know, you hear so many stories in our business about this guy was tough or that guy was tough or, you know, did you see this guy do that, do this or the other thing? And that's one of the things I don't know of anybody that ever got in Harley's face and said, well, let's go. And if you know of somebody, tell me about it, because <laughs> I don't know anybody that ever pulled that stunt. You know, that's like the Valentine thing with uh, Jay Ork and the Atomizer. And then they took that on the road. Didn't they end up doing that in multiple different... I, I think so. <laughs> I think so. But, uh, well, you know, it, that, that's the thing. I, I, I think it, Harley, Harley never, to, the, to my knowledge anyway, you know, when we met in 63 or any other time over the years, uh, I don't know. Harley never set out to intimidate me. Uh, I was never, I never thought, well, I've got to watch my P's and Q's with Harley, but it never crossed my mind to push him, you know, to try him. And, and listen, I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not a badass to begin with. I'll be the first to tell you that on a list of a hundred, I'll be, I'll be the 101st to pick. But uh, I, I think, you know, you just, the way Harley carried himself. And of course, you know, he had a reputation, but you know, you respected the man. That was first, last, and always in my mind. 
uh, when we were kids in 63 in Kansas City, it never crossed my mind that I was better than Harley as a person or, or I grew up different because he grew up doing this and I grew up doing something else. That never crossed my mind. From the initial, uh, our initial contact till the last time we spoke, I've always respected Harley and I've never crossed my mind to, to try him or, or to question, you know, if he told me this is going to happen or this did happen. Well, like we were just talking about the thing with Vince. If Harley told me it happened, it happened. Now, there's no way, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to sit and argue with Vince about it either. But uh, if Harley, I mean, it, it's not, Harley wouldn't have made it up. That's, that's the best story I can tell you. If Harley told me it happened, it happened. That's, that's the way I look at it. Well, Les, as we wrap up this segment, you have told us so many things about Harley, the person that we would normally know, things like him and his dog sitting in the chair. But to talk about Harley, the wrestler, you've seen so many world champions from the time when you were a fan, from getting into the business as a wrestler, from working in the office, from being a commentator. Where do you rank Harley Race? How do you see him? How was he as a fit as the NWA champion, as the touring champion during those years? Like hand and glove. He was, uh, and I think part of that speech, you know, up until Flair 16 times, and of course that got to be ridiculous. I think you'll agree with me, right? I mean, yeah. I'm not saying that Rick didn't deserve to be champion, but I don't know anybody. I mean, realize when I was a kid, the fact that Luthez wore it a second time was a major upheaval in the world, right? And so that Harley eight times, there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that, and uh, I, I think that you know uh, that speaks for itself. He's, uh, you know, I, I, you know, how do you rank? Well, I've had the opportunity to work with with Thez, O'Connor, Kaninsky, Harley, Terry, uh, Flair, Steamboat, Jack. Uh, I don't know how to, you know, if if you held a gun to my head and and said less list them in chronological order as you, uh, you know, where you think they should be. I'd say, Brian, just shoot me because I don't want to do that. Well, I'll tell you what, then let me rephrase the question. What do you think is the legacy that Harley race leaves behind? One of the greatest champions of all time, uh, a man who uh, brought dignity and class to our business, who presented himself in a way that you respected the industry as well as the performer. And uh, I, I think any of us who were his friends, uh, are better people for it. And I think that uh, he's left a hell of a void in our business. But as far as I'm concerned, his legacy uh, shouldn't be questioned. And uh, he was one of the greatest of all time and a dear friend, and God bless him. I mentioned before that Les Thatcher was the longtime voice of Southeastern Wrestling. Of course, the owner of Southeastern Wrestling, as well as the major star there, was Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud. And recently on the Super Studcast, available for patrons of the Studcast, we discussed Ron's 10 most memorable matches, and of course one of them had to be with Harley Race. This is while Harley Race was the NWA champion, he came into Knoxville for a very memorable match with Ron Fuller. Let's hear Ron's recollection of that right now. Yes, sir. And I uh, always loved working with Harley. Uh, this is the only ma time I ever wrestled Harley when it wasn't a world championship match. And uh, it was uh, it was a really, really phenomenal event uh, for fans who liked uh, gore and, uh, you know, blood and guts. This this match had a whole lot of that. Uh, so and I'd already had my first world title shot with Harley on, on April 28th, 1977. Uh, and uh, this uh, this match comes about six months later, uh, and uh, we wrestled six minute sixty minute time limit draw on that match in April of seventy seven, and and uh, I wanted to bring him back again, but I didn't want to bring him back in another world championship match. Uh, and this that first match that he had just had that first world championship match that's the match in which uh, he got a two thousand dollar cash payoff and. Uh, Harley was very, very happy about it. And, uh, and he's told me, he said, I'm going to go talk to Sam and see if Sam will allow him back as soon as possible. Within days, uh, Sam called me and, uh, he said, uh, that Harley would defend again one month later on, uh, on May 27th, 77. So we got ready, uh, uh made interviews each week to offering bounties. Uh, Harley started offering these bounties, uh, 
uh, to anyone that could beat me because that, that disqualified me as the number one challenger. And he had a bounty match in Knoxville with the former champion Terry Funk uh, two weeks before the uh, the, the match. Uh, and uh, I won against Terry for the first time in Knoxville at this point in 1977. And I also won a bounty match in uh, Memphis against Jerry Lawler nine days before the title match. So Harley wrestled Harley and I again on 5-27-77, one month after the uh, the first world championship match, another world championship match to another 60 minute draw. And uh, so he was really excited about that, that draw match too. that match that 60 minute match. Most of the time you come back following a 60 minute match with another one. It's pretty difficult sometimes, but that was a really great match as well. So Harley suggested, you know, uh, that, uh, that he weren't, he knew we were re- he were scheduled back on uh, on October fifth, in nineteen seventy seven, and uh, so both of these matches have been been twice early in nineteen seventy seven. They obviously sold out and, um, championship prices. It was they were big events, but I didn't want to come back again with another world championship match. So I talked to uh, Harley about it. I said, Harley, let's do a Texas Death Match uh, n- when you come back next time. Uh, and that's very rarely done that you have a champion come in. He's going to be in a Texas death match with somebody. And I kind of like that idea anyway, to do something different. And it would make more sense if I beat him in a Texas death match to come back against him in another world title match after that. So he made the interviews for the match saying the only way he would ever put up the world title against me again is if I could beat him in his type of match, the a Texas death match. Uh, so so now we can talk about one of the few matches I ever had against a world champion that was not for the title. And I think this is, as I can remember, the only time I ever wrestled a, a, a present world champion that was not for the championship. So it was a Texas death match on October 5th, 1977. So even though it's not the world title match, uh, this night was another sellout. It didn't make any difference uh, back in those days in Knoxville in the 77s and 78s. Uh, you were going to sell out. Uh, didn't make much difference what you did. I wish we'd had a bigger building. But uh, the fans were just uh, electric in the building. Uh, it was one of those matches. I, I got goosebumps going to the ring. The people were just so into it. Uh, and, and it was probably the best Texas death match of my career. Uh, certainly the end of it, without doubt. Uh, it had lots of falls, and both of us were bleeding much of the match. Uh, I was bleeding bad, a lot more than Harley was, uh, but it was a it was a really, really, really good match. Uh, we did a lot less wrestling, obviously, than any any of the world title matches we'd had. Uh, but uh, we we made the difference up by doing a lot of dangerous things outside the ring that we didn't do before. He piled drive me on the concrete at one point in there, and the referee counted me out on the floor, but I was able to get back in the ring before the 10 count. Uh, I think the fans really enjoyed this match, uh, especially those that loved the blood and guts. This was this was right up their alley. Uh, then it was, uh, it was up Harley's alley, too. I mean, we did things that we couldn't do in a world title match and probably went about 45 minutes and really had the crowd in, up really, really with us in the last 15 minutes. As, as time got longer, we, we both began to blow up a little bit. Uh, we were expending a whole lot of energy doing a lot of things outside the ring and back inside the ring. So he finally got control and won about four straight falls right at the end of the match. And then he threw me over on the over the top rope uh, on top of the announcer's table. And they came out of the ring and he picked me up. He's standing on the announcer's table. He picked me up and he slammed me on the table. Uh, and uh, I'd never had anybody do that to me before. I was really, really concerned when he started to pick me up to slam me. And he, we're both standing on top of that table. Uh, they grabbed the bell off the table, obviously, the announcer. And there's another timekeeper there. And they backed off to get away from what was going on and uh so there was a big crowd believe me when my back because i was sweating really bad anyway and when he slammed me it sounded like a shotgun went off uh, because my back was all wet and the crowd just had a big one of those big kind of like a japan gasp that's about all you get out of the japanese is when you do something really really bad to somebody you get that ooh 
They got that ooh out of the slam on top of the table. And then Harley goes up uh, back in the ring and climbs up on the top rope. Uh, on And uh, right by the post that's right above me. And I'm laying on my back. He's just slamming me. I'm still laying there. And I see him start out of the end back into the ring and climb up on the top rope. And uh, and he gets up there and he's going to do his headbutt that he does for a finish, except it's always in the middle of the ring. Now I'm outside laying on my back on a table and he's I see him coming off. I see him put his arms down by his side like he does for that move. And here he comes. And uh, I just rolled off the table. And he goes through that table head first. Uh, uh, it was like it, it was like a bullet. He was coming down at me like a bullet, and uh, I rolled off uh, and onto the concrete. And I watched. Uh, I was probably within three feet of where he landed, and his head went straight through the table, and his body with his arms were all locked into and. It was a horrible sound as his head connected with the table, first of all. And then when the table broke in half, uh, his head and body disappeared and the table kind of folded up around him. The only part of his body you could see was his legs sticking straight out up in the air. And uh, and they were wiggling back and forth. I was like, uh, gosh, man, I can't believe he can even wiggle his legs uh, after taking a bump like that. Uh, it's the greatest bump anyone in that building including me had ever seen i'd never seen a bump like that uh, and uh, after a few seconds of kicking his legs he his legs just got still and uh, he never moved a muscle i crawled back in the ring i struggled up on my feet and collapsed the referee gave him the 10 count and he he raised my hand so uh i laid there for about 60 seconds and rolled the apron and off onto the concrete floor and I must have laid on the floor for another 60 seconds, and and I was blown up, really blown up, and, and, and lost a lot of blood. And So I finally regained my feet, and I was helped toward the dressing room by fans that actually came to ringside and got me underneath the arm, and they, they were kind of helping get me back to the dressing room. But I had to turn. I could not help myself. I turned and looked back, and this is probably two minutes after he took this bump. His feet legs were still sticking out straight up in the air he had not moved at all and uh you know right at that point if i ever had any question in my mind about the toughness of harley race boy it went right down the drain right there i mean he it just to me that was the most remarkable bump i ever saw in wrestling and uh i don't know how he lived through it we're going to talk about a few more NWA world champions here on your list, but when it comes to Harley Race, Ron, you had Jack Briscoe, Terry Funk, Ric Flair come into Southeastern and Continental, but Harley Race was probably the champion the longest period of time, thinking about it right now, while you were a promoter. What did you think of Harley in that role as a world champion compared to the other guys that you brought in as the world champion? Well, you know, the the great thing about the NWA world champions is they're they're all so unique in their abilities. Uh Jack Briscoe's the wrestler, uh Terry Funk is the wild man, uh Dory Funk Jr. is the wrestler. Uh Harley Race is just a fighter. He's just a tough son of a gun. I mean, uh uh Flair does a little bit of both, uh but uh in my opinion, Harley was so unique in his ability to his he hit people just really feared harley race it was funny you know he wasn't a massively huge guy but when you got close to harley and you really looked at him you realized that man this guy is something different man you know you just had a you get that feel about people sometimes that uh that they're dangerous. And Harley was one of those guys that you just felt like when you looked at him, that this guy can be dangerous. He, he can go beyond what wrestlers normally go if he needs to, to, to do whatever he would need to do. Uh, he was a great talent. Uh, one, the remarkable thing about all world uh, NWA world champions is their ability to really just to get it done in the ring. And, uh, Harley's style was totally different. And I think that's one of the things the NWA world champions were so uh, 
picked so well at too is because they all had a little different style. You didn't get to see the same guy time after time. Uh, they all were a little bit different. And Harley was in a class of his own. You know, Mike, there are so many different guys that you associate with Harley Race, whether it's the long-term feuds like Dusty Rhodes or David Von Erich, or whether it's Ric Flair and the chase for the title. But another name a lot of people think about, obviously, would be Wildfire Tommy Rich, whose popularity exploded in Georgia, and that popularity led him to getting a short run with the NWA title in 1981, where he got to defeat Harley Race before, shortly thereafter, losing it back to Harley Race in Georgia. Tommy Rich was on the Super Studcast a little while back, talking with Ron Fuller about his memories of Harley. Let's hear some of this right now. Hey, I got a question for you. We're trying to change gears here a little bit. Uh, who was you work with all kinds of world champions, man? Who who was your favorite to work with? Oh, bar none, Harley Race. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that was really funny. Because, you know, people ask me that same question, and that's my answer, too. You know, that's really funny. That's odd, you know, because I thought, well, you know, uh, you know, a lot of those guys were great workers, but I always seem to have the best match with Harley of, of all the guys and on Harley, the world champions. And, and, and what's so impressive about Harley, I seen him one night, I went to Kansas City, and uh, – I think Bulldog Briar, something was a baby face and something was wrong with him. And they had to send a heel out there to wrestle Harley. And in a matter of two minutes, Harley went from the hottest heel to the biggest baby face in Kansas City, you know, because he got on that mic and just told a little story. You know, he didn't have to do no angle. He just went out there and said, what? I don't remember what he said. But the people went from boo to yay in a matter of two minutes, three minutes, you know. And and it just hardly and and um you know, I ain't knocking nobody, but uh, some folks have the same match, whether it's Ron Fuller or Tommy Rich or who it is, they have the same match when we talk about world champions. Their match is the same. They do the same stuff. Harley, if he worked with Tommy Rich, it'd be different from when he worked with Ron Fuller. You know, yeah. it, Harley, Harley was just a uh, mastermind of this business, a uh, wizard, whatever you want to call it. Harley just had the mind. Uh, he could get them people. I mean, he just, Harley was great to me. Oh, yeah. I mean, I worked with him uh, twice in two years in a row on about the same month, uh, 60, 76, 77 in Knoxville. Biggest crowd they ever drew in a Coliseum and uh, and uh, had two totally different matches. And the last match I had with him was a Texas death match. First one was a world title match. We went an hour and five minutes and then uh, came back the next year and had a Texas death match. And he took the damnedest bump I have ever seen. Uh Cause I was saying, Harley, I don't know how we're going to finish this. And he would say, he said, well, he says, let me slam you, Ron. He says, do you have an announcer's table out there that announcers sit at? And I said, yeah. And the ring rings on the table and old deal, the bell. And he said, well, make sure they get the bell out of the way. But he goes, we'll get out there. And he says, let me slam you on that table. Let me go up on the top rope. Like I'm going to do my dive, the head, butt. And, uh, he said, when I come off there, you roll off. And he went head first through that table. And his feet were sticking out the top of it. The table just collapsed in the middle. And his feet were sticking out the top. <laughs> and it was like oh, the awfulest was... bump I ever saw, man. I couldn't believe he would do that. Uh, that was the end of our Texas death match, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he was amazing in the ring. He, and like you say, he never had the same match twice. He just, he just, no. he, had, he had a, he had a feel for what the people wanted to see. And I loved it. Slam Harley. That that was my deal. Cause oh, God, yeah. you know, yeah. He just that, he just floated up there, man, and I, you know, at six nine, I'd like to get him up there, and I would hold him, hesitate, and then when I would slam him, I was able to jump in the air and slam him like it was. A, I was getting even higher, and take that great bump. Oh wow, he was great guy to work with, super guy to work with. Oh Lord, yeah, and love to push you in the car after the match is about hundred miles an hour too. Oh yeah, man. He was he was the most dangerous <laughs> son of a gun in there. Most everything he did, he was pretty wild and crazy. 
You know, like a boat yeah. accident he had on the lake. He had a boat a- accident on the lake up there where he lives in the Lake of the Ozarks. And uh, there's a, you know, running crazy as heck one night in this boat with no running lights on it and runs yeah. up on the back of a, of a houseboat where people sitting out there on the back deck, right? I mean, he's it's, it's just like an accident looking for some place to happen. <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't imagine that with nobody but Harley. I mean, Harley, you could expect that to happen because he was crazy. Oh, but hey, one of the best, one of the best folks that I ever met. God bless you, Harley. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and it, it, and he just uh, he was a tough, tough son of a gun too. He was rugged. Is he would be the last guy you'd want to get in a fight with in a bar because you know he's oh, going to yeah. he's going to do whatever it takes, man, to to leave you laying. And uh, that was you know. Tremendous guy. You know, I loved Harley. I always loved Harley Race. Working with him was always an experience. Another place that Harley Race went into as the world champion was Memphis, Tennessee. And, of course, the kingfish in Memphis, so to speak, was none other than Jerry the King Lawler. They had a series of matches that are legendary. And one of the music videos of those matches is still watched today, and it looks so cool. We wanted to talk a little bit about Harley's history in Memphis. What exactly was it? And we spoke with the host of Kentucky Fried Wrestling right here on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Scott Bowden, one of the top Memphis wrestling historians, about the legacy Harley Race left behind in Memphis, Tennessee. Let's go to this right now. We continue our look at the life and career of Harley Race this week on the Super Podcast by focusing on the impact he made in memphis tennessee and to do that with us we have the host of kentucky fried wrestling right here on the arcadian vanguard podcast network your friend and mine scott bowden scott thanks for being here today hey it's a real pleasure uh, I'm, I'm honored that you would uh, ask me to appear on the on the show honoring the greatest wrestler on god's green earth uh god bless him harley race one of a kind you know when you think of world champions in memphis of course at various times they just created their own world champion Lawler had the AWA championship, which was a big deal because they had spent so many years building up the AWA championship and building up Nick Bockwinkle. Ric Flair makes an appearance a couple times in the 1980s, but it's really an AWA championship territory. Before that, of course, Jerry Jarrett was associated, and Nicholas before him, with the NWA, and one of the last NWA champions to come into Memphis was Harley Race. Talk a little bit about the first time they brought him in in the 1970s. Uh, well, the the most significant uh, about that I can recall, uh, it was the second time that they were doing the quest for the title. They basically were uh, going through all the NWA top 10 contenders. And this time, Lawler had been around. He, he was a little bit more established. So some of the big names they brought in were more willing to put Jerry over clean as opposed to some kind of screwy finish. And Harley came in as the number three ranked contender. And uh, this was the this ended up being the last time that Sam Bass accompanied uh, the King to the ring. Uh, I have a great shot uh, that I fooled around with and colorized uh, of of Sam in his corner. Lawler's got the old Southern heavyweight title around his waist. And, you know, he's looking really serious. You can tell he's looking across at Harley Race, uh, realizing that uh, he's got to go through a former world heavyweight champion if he even wants to continue the climb toward a shot at Terry Funk. Of course, Harley had only been a champion for a short period of time, a few years earlier. Here we are in 1976. Terry Funk is the NWA champion. But even though it was a short reign, Harley being the NWA champion still carried a lot of weight. And that's why he was here in Memphis this night. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, people, they, they, some people say, oh, people in Memphis, they, they thought that wrestling just existed on Monday nights. But I, I, I honestly think that that's selling the fans short. I think that they were they were a little bit more educated than that. And I think people knew the reputation of Harley Race. They knew he was a former world's heavyweight champion. And it goes to show you, I mean, that Harley is, is even when he's not the world champion, he understands what Jerry Jarrett's trying to do here and, and build this guy up. Uh, has a legit threat to the World Heavyweight Champion because Lawler had so many attempts at the belt already. And so the only way you're going to really get fan interest uh, in such a bout is if Lawler plows through the contenders. And and they actually did a wonderful thing the following week where they brought in new number two contender, Jack Briscoe, and Lawler stumbles and loses uh, in a little swerve. 
uh, and then uh, regains it from Briscoe the following week and then has to beat Dory Funk Jr. in a Texas death match, no less, to finally get a crack at Terry. But Harley was definitely instrumental and and was willing to come in and put the kid over clean. Uh, you know, how clean was it with Sam Bassinball? But from what I understand, in this case, it was a pinfall. So he was on board with that. There supposedly some animosity between Harley and, and Lawler. Uh, I, I explained uh, this is part of the the legend uh, that that Harley himself kind of helped spread, uh, and they were shocked to to hear about it. Uh, Jerry Jarrett seems to recall something maybe when Harley showed up uh, in December of '77. And, and at this time, he was the NWA World Champion, and he kind of made a crack about, "Oh, it, here's the point at Lawler. Here's the man who pinned Harley uh, Andre the Giant and and half the NWA in a matter of weeks. Oh my God, he's a, he's a killer." And kind of did it deadpan. And, and Jarrett said, you know, a lot a lot of people don't know this, but Harley had a really great sense of humor, but really dry. And, you know, maybe Lawler's eyes got a little wide, but there was no, like, confrontation of <laughs> Harley, you know, throwing his suitcase across the floor and threatening to, uh, to shoot on Lawler. Uh, I think it was just one of those things that... Harley kind of messed with with Lawler and Jared a little bit and then laughed about it and went about it was a true pro. Um, and uh, I don't know why later on the, the story got bigger than it did. But, hey, that, that's what happens in wrestling circles. Well, of course, in 1976, he loses to Jerry Lawler on Lawler's quest for the title, his second quest. And then in early 77, he defeats Terry Funk in Toronto, Ontario, Canada to win back the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. And it's just a short time after this that he returns to Memphis. And now at this period of time, in March of 1977, everything is about to go to hell in a handbasket in Memphis in terms of everything between Goulas and Jarrett has come to a head and the explosion has happened. Yeah. One of the last few uh, co-promoted shows, and I believe just from looking at the card, I believe that Jarrett did book it. Uh, and it was a sellout. Uh, you know, anything could cons- anything over 11,000 fans was considered a sellout. This was uh, not, not quite to full capacity because it wasn't 11,365, but I think it was 11,287. And on that night, uh, Harley, uh, defeated Rocky Johnson with an assist from a disgruntled Jerry Lawler who felt like he should be the one challenging race for the belt. So Rocky Johnson is the one getting the NWA title shot here in Memphis. How big a star was Rocky at this period of time in early 77 in Memphis? Oh, he got over huge. Uh, they were, you know, again, it's just, in my opinion, it's just one of those things. Uh, Jarrett paid attention to pop culture. He paid attention to what was going on in other sports. And, and you know, unless you were living under a rock, you know, everybody heard about Ali and Anoki. And even though Johnson had worked a show in Memphis uh, about a year before, they they were thinking that nobody, probably nobody remembered. It was I think he was in a, in a you know, maybe in the first match of the evening, so probably very unforgettable. So they brought him in as a boxer, right? <laughs> and they even got uh, Charlie Watson, the local uh, newscaster, to, to go along with all this. And they actually did a, a live weigh-in uh, during a WHBQ news broadcast and treated this like it was a shoot. That this is the first time that that a box that a, you know, the former sparring partner of Muhammad Ali is is going to step in there. And he, and Rocky was just so chiseled and thick. And I mean, he just he looked like a guy uh, who could be a legit world class athlete. Um, And, you know, of course, Lawler's, you know, getting in uh, in Charlie uh, asking, you know, are you uh, now what is this? You know, are you taking that? How serious are you taking this match? Because, oh, I'm serious as a heart attack. I'm going to show you that a wrestler can beat a boxer anytime. Trust me. And they end up drawing uh, 10,000 fans. And I guarantee you they gave him a much better show. (laughs) <laughs> than uh, Anoki and Ali did. And, and I don't know about Memphis, but Jim Cornette took a great shot of the bout in Louisville that I think sold it out as well. Uh, Lawler's wearing the uh, black and, Ali black and white Everlast trunks. <laughs> and he's climbing up after, after Johnson has just clocked him one. So uh, that was really good stuff there. So, yeah, he was over big time. So for race to come in, uh, and I think it gave, you know, I think it would have gotten old if Lawler keeps getting the shots and and coming up short. And it also strengthened uh, Harley's rep for when they finally did get around to a rematch between the two, because that's what, you know, that's one of the basic 
uh, tenets of booking, right? You, you keep two guys apart and then put them on a collision course. And in this case, it was a very slow build because uh, Hardy came in again weeks later. Clearly, his, you know, the support of the NWA, even though they allowed Goulas and Jarrett to uh, both book the town, the deck was stacked against Goulas. Because look at that. I mean, if we go to April 24th, uh, 1977, uh, monumental because it's Jim Cornette's first show at the Coliseum, uh, but also because Eddie Graham brings in half the Florida crew. Uh, Steve Kern, Mike Graham, I think Kevin Sullivan, Dusty Rhodes. Uh, Jack Briscoe does the honors for Lawler, and that's the night. That's the infamous photo of uh, Lawler throwing the big thing of powder in, in Briscoe's eyes and blinding him. Uh, Eddie Gilbert's taking photos at ringside using Mike Shields' equipment because Mike is filming the entire card in 16 millimeter. And I asked Mike if he had that footage recently, and he said, "Nope." <laughs> And, and that was a real bummer. I was hoping that he would uh, maybe uh, some, you know, maybe somewhere someday that that card will emerge and uh, and that would be a piece of gold. But uh, on that night, uh, headlined by uh, by Harley Race and Rocky Johnson, this is how much faith they had. And Harley has a draw. Sure. You know, the belt was a draw, but Memphis was all about believability. And 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 I know that sounds crazy, given all the all the gimmick matches, but it was almost like the fans knew that okay, that part, that's just, you know, the for for the kids or whatever. Uh it really was a a a territory that was that was really based around sincerity. And Harley believed when he cut those gruff, rough around the edges promos, he believed with all his heart that he was the greatest wrestler walking God's green earth. And you felt that and you knew it. And then he would come in and, and give the challenger a lot. He was, he was so generous with his offense, but he came off a, a little tougher uh, than the, than Flair did. Cause he was a little smoother in the ring. Um, and his offense, I think, was a, was a little uh, better uh, when he was in control and punishing his foe. Uh, he didn't do as many screwy finishes as as uh, Rick did, at least not in the early going. Um, the finishes sort of got out of hands, I think, in the uh, in the early '80s. But uh, but Harley was tremendous and and a great and really a great fit for Memphis. Uh, and it's a shame that that he didn't work the territory more. There was a shot uh, that there was a match that was built up between Lawler and Paul Orndorff. And Orndorff was one of those guys who Jerry Jarrett saw, you know, in the opening matches in Florida. And, Asked Eddie, said, what are you doing with this kid? He said, nothing. If you want him, take him. And immediately, Orndorff gets over. Uh, I mean, what's not to like? You know, the, he's a good-looking guy, former football player, a real athlete. Uh, he and Lawler in a, are in a feud for the Southern title. And ultimately, it culminates. Winter gets a shot at Harley Race. And this is in July of 77. And that bout never happens. You know? Uh, it, it, the Harley it, Race bout, you mean? Yeah, the Harley Race. Yeah, uh, Lawler, Lawler, Lawler regains the title. Uh, puts him in line for a shot at race. And I don't know if this was, you know, I, this pure speculation. I don't know if this was st- start of the growing frustration on getting a date on Harley, because even those aforementioned uh, shows uh, in, in the first show, first Jarrett card has an owner in, in uh, April of 77. I mean, that had to be a Sunday night show because they couldn't get Monday nights. And the reason why they couldn't is because the WA was, they were more likely to give you whatever night you wanted, if you booked the champion like three or four dates in a row so he could kind of stay in the territory. And Jarrett just didn't see the need to have the champion in Louisville, uh, especially in Evansville uh, and in Lexington. Um, he, he just didn't think that it was that it was worth the money. And again, Jarrett would get a lot of mileage by just building up the appearance. So by the time Harley does come around to defend against Lawler in December of 77, you know, this is a match that people have been waiting all year to see, and it doesn't disappoint because it draws nearly 10,000 people. And this is around Christmas time. And and almost like clockwork, uh, in December, attendance could be, could be a little sketchy because, you know, fans are they got they got bills to pay. They got Christmas shopping to do. December traditionally was was a was a tough month to draw. But with Harley Race and Lawler on top. They draw two back-to-back houses and nearly 10,000 fans, which is really impressive. So it ends up being a really impactful year in 77 in a lot of ways for Harley Race with his limited appearances in Memphis because 
He main events the last show in Memphis that Jarrett and Goulas promote together. He main events the first Jerry Jarrett promoted show at the Mid-South Coliseum. And here at the end of the year, these two matches with Lawler, I want you to talk a little bit about what happens in these matches. But one question for you, Scott. There's a music video that Memphis would play from time to time in years after this match that was really cool because it made the match look so great. Just Lawler and Harley Race going back and forth. Which match was it from? Uh, that was from the first one, the December, uh, is December 11th, I believe. Uh, and they went 60 minutes and what's, what's tremendous about that, that video package they put together was so far ahead of its time. It's, it's very much like what, almost like what WWE would, would do today. A lot of quick cuts, uh, that made it seem like the action was nonstop, even though, you know, they went 60 minutes. It was. <laughs> <laughs> it truly wasn't nonstop, but they ended up uh, showing the entire match. Uh, I know in Tupelo they aired the entire thing because I have Lance Russell doing an intro for it. Uh, and that eventually found its way into circulation. And it's also one of those tapes, I believe, that Jim Cornette said that Lawler personally asked him at the time for a copy of it because he wanted to hang on to it. And Lawler is not typically one of those sentimental guys who... Uh, likes to talk about, oh, what was your best match? That's, that's the worst question for any, anybody out there. If you ever get a chance to interview Lawler or anything, don't ask him about what he thinks his, his best matches were. The, the best way to ask him about anything is to ask about a particular person. And there's no doubt in my mind uh, that that match with Harley Race was one of Lawler's best matches. Uh, Lawler does some different, but you know, because they have they have to go an hour. Lawler's doing like the India Deathlock and trying all these different ways to beat Race, and then it's 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 interesting. It's an interesting uh, contrast because Lawler's actually trying to out wrestle him in, in, in certain spots, and then he he gets frustrated and he goes back to the punches. And then he tries to do some more wrestling holds and suplexes. That doesn't work. So then he goes back to what he knows best, and that's the punches. And nobody sold punches better than Harley Race. Uh, he took he took th- that crazy kind of Terry Funk bump where he spills, like they have a mid-ring collision. Harley spins out, falls out of the ring. His feet catch uh, on the uh, between the middle and top rope, and he's just flat out hanging there. Uh, a, a different spot in the match. Uh, Lawler beats uh, race back into uh, the ring. It looks like Harley's going to get counted out, but he climb. He's literally climbing up the steps. And the reason why this is significant is because he- here is like the world's best wrestler, and the fans believe in this. And he's just out on his feet, just taking a beating, making Lawler look like a million dollars. And he's climbing up the steps pathetically to get back into the ring. Not even doesn't even look like he knows where he is. And then Lawler clocks him with a right hand. Harley falls back down, spills and slides back down the steps, bump, 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 and then hits his head and sells it. And it's just, it's just, it's just tremendous. And it's hard for me to believe that after that match, uh, that Harley didn't seem to show much Lawler respect uh, in interviews. Um, I don't quite know why, uh, because every time he came in, you know, he came in in 76, Sam Bass's last, tragically, uh, you know, this is also the anniversary of Sam Bass's passing recently. Um, and, he, you know, he put the kid over clean. He always did what, whatever Jarrett and Lawler uh, wanted him to do. And for them to come back on back to back, you know, Memphis fans are cre- creatures of habit. And uh, I believe even one of those, so one of them was a Sunday and one of them even may have been a Tuesday because, again, they just could not get uh dates uh monday night dates because it's such it was such a big wrestling town uh, nationwide and for them to draw over ten thousand fans on not their usual night during the christmas season was huge uh and in that one it was a uh, it was billed as a 90 minute time and you know and you can't even imagine you know you saw the 60 minute match and you think my goodness you know could these guys go 90 minutes uh they don't they go about 40 uh and lawler has race beat and Jimmy Valiant, who's been injured by Lawler, I think Lawler threw the fire at him. Uh, and Valiant cut this promo that I doubt would have aired uh, years later, uh, where he his, he dr- he drops the mic. He goes, "Lawler, you're dead," and drops the mic. And then you don't see handsome Jimmy for about three weeks. And man, right when Lawler's got the world title in his grasp, he comes in with a Coke bottle that's been uh, put into an oven for a couple hours to soften it up, and clocks Lawler uh, and. The bottle actually broke a little too soon, if you really watch it closely. So Valiant didn't feel like he, he got 
Lawler good enough with a shot. So he picks up a, a jagged piece of glass and is going to go after Lawler's eye. And this, I, you know, and that was an improv move. So I guess this was too. Harley hooked his arm, and and I just thought that was kind of cool that the world champion is disgusted by this 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 pathetic display this you know this street fight that suddenly breaks out during one of his matches uh i thought it was completely logical and clearly was an improv move uh because valiant uh, was not supposed to do that harley wouldn't come back to memphis until a brief run in 1985 shortly before he would go to the world wrestling federation any memories of this run which i think saw him get the mid-america title at one point yeah you know harley still looked good i thought um uh, you know, clearly, I, I thought that by 81, Jarrett's decision to go with Nick Bogwinkle certainly looked uh, very smart. You know, and it wasn't that Har- that that he did respect Harley or that he thought Harley was a poor wrestler. And, he, and there was nothing to do with that. It had more to do with the politics, with the NWA board and his growing frustration uh, on getting Lawler a run with the championship, feeling like he could convince Vern Gagne uh, you know, only one man as opposed to an entire board. And plus, having Nick Bockwinkle was just the icing on the cake because uh, Nick was, was I, I believe, a little younger than Harley, uh, or at least looked it, um, and just carried himself a little more regally. And more important, changed things up a lot, you know, because Harley was a bit of a routine guy, you know, had kind of the same spots that Flair would do, uh, which you could sort of get, you know, get away with when the champion didn't come to town that often and before cable television, but he was a lot, he was a lot smoother about it than, than I think flair. Uh, not quite as smooth as Briscoe, but then again, nobody was. Uh, but uh, I, I thought, I thought Harley looked great in 85 and he actually came in and he's the one who got Phil Hickerson over. Hick- Hickerson had, had been a respected wrestler in uh, the late seventies and was over, as, but primarily as a tag team guy. They bring him back out of nowhere. He hadn't been, been wrestling. He's, he'd been a disc jockey. And, but the guy could still go. He was sort of like Dusty Rhodes. He didn't have any kind of a physique. He looked like he should be, you know, maybe a, a bowler, a professional bowler, if anything. Uh, but he comes in, and to get him over as the international champion, Hickerson and Race have these blood baths. And I was there for one of them. Uh, I, believe, I believe both of them feel one by count out. So Harley comes in. Probably the last place he wants to be is in Memphis. But again, he's part of a car that draws 10,000 people. And this is when Vince is starting to invade the territory. And uh, Lawler is working with Idol against the Freebirds on top. And when Idol abruptly leaves because he wants more money, imagine that. <laughs> they have Phil ready to take over that top baby pace spot because he's got victories over Harley, back-to-back weeks, and Terry Taylor. But the significant one was beating a former NWA world champion on back-to-back weeks. And they were both if, – if, if the first bout was anything like the second one that I saw live, 20 minutes of just a pure bloodbath. It was fantastic. I guess one last thing we need to discuss because it is something that a lot of people talk about. The lawsuit that would later pop up where Jerry Lawler sued because the World Wrestling Federation was coming to Memphis with Harley Race, who at that point had been given Jerry Lawler's gimmick the king of wrestling, and it was the newspaper ads that actually triggered the complaint. What do you know about the lawsuit, and give any details that I've missed? Yeah, you know, it, it, I think it's it's overblown a little bit. It it had more to do with some of the tactics that Lawler and Jarrett were, were using to to counteract the McMahon offensive. Uh, you know, and I, I, Jerry Jarrett, I think, likes to kind of play down how worried he was initially, uh, but they, but they, 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 McMahon clearly had his attention because they were doing all sorts of things like holding free cards uh, at the uh, Chick Stadium, you know, on, on the fairgrounds the night of WWF matches. And WWF did not draw well initially. And it, it was because, or they would have, I remember they had a card uh, downtown, uh, uh, an outdoor card, and every ticket was like two or three bucks the same night as a WWF show. So they were, and they had a so, uh, softball game with good guys versus the bad guys for free, I think, again at, at, at Chick Stadium, right next door to the Coliseum. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot of, because Jared and Lawler were defending their turf, and it had less to do with Lawler and race and more to do with uh, them coming in and especially adding insult to injury, the, the ads, and I saw these ads. They didn't say Harley Race or the King Harley Race or whatever. They just said the King. And that's what got 
I wouldn't say it necessarily got Lawler's blood boiling, but that's what got him. That's that's what won him the case because the judge looked at it and and felt that yes, this could easily create confusion in the marketplace. So uh, everywhere else, Harley was the king, but when he came to t- Tennessee, he was billed as Harley Race, and he was not able he was not allowed to wear any regal attire <laughs> to the <laughs> ring. So I don't know if that included the color purple or or what, but um, uh, at any rate, uh, and after after that, you know, the, there was no there's no lasting heat really in wrestling. And I know that after his run ended, and gosh, you know, we all know Hardy took that awful bump on the table against Hulk Hogan. I mean, I think it's a testament to show you, though, that Harley, even though he didn't quite have the look uh, for the WWF at that time, just how respected he was by McMahon and that that they felt like he could have a showcase match with Hogan on network television. The guy still had it, and he had, you know, probably at this time working in in some pain, and then has the unfortunate accident. But when he's when he comes back and he's ready to wrestle again, it, he called Lawler up and said, "Hey, kid, how about some King versus King matches?" And Lawler thought about it for a little bit, talked to Jared, and and finally Lawler said to Jared, "He goes, I just he doesn't look he doesn't look too good. Last time I saw him, he just." I don't I don't think the fans will be into it. He, he, you know, it's, it's not the same Harley race uh, as he used to be, unfortunately. But, you know, there was never any, any disrespect about Harley race because they showed that they showed that uh, video a lot of Harley. And I even did a recut on my YouTube channel where I took footage from the 60 minute draw and found a, a, a 17 minute live version of the same song and, and cut that together and worked a long time on it because I had such a great appreciation for the initial effort. Scott, so many champions have come through Memphis during the Jerry Lawler years. Jack Briscoe, Terry Funk, Ric Flair, of course, eventually the AWA with Nick Bockwinkel, Kurt Hennig, Kerry Von Erich, I guess we could even include. What's Harley Race's place? Where does he stand amongst the champions that came into Memphis? And what's the legacy he leaves behind during the Jerry Lawler years? Well, unfortunately, I, I, I wish that he and Lawler had had more bouts. Uh, there was a chemistry there, I, I, I felt like. Um, but Harley, Harley was going to have his style of match no matter what, where, I, whereas I think Bockwinkle was more willing to kind of, he and Lawler would get together and they, man, they, I just saw them put together so many diff- different matches live. Uh, no two matches were exactly the same. Nick, Nick was less of a routine guy. So I, I, in my opinion, I think it's Briscoe, uh, Bockwinkle, uh, race would have to be in there, you know, maybe Maybe behind Funk, um, but then again, you know, he headlined the very first show for Jarrett, which was huge, um, and really that put Jarrett on great footing. You know, they raised the ticket. That, that show would have sold out, but at first it wasn't on a Monday night, and just to be sure that they had enough money to pay all this other talent, they raised the ticket prices, uh, and if they hadn't, I think it w- for, for sure would have sold out, and then to come back and draw you know, two straight weeks back to back. And part of that had to do with the fact that Harley was so good at making fans believe that the local guy, you know, you hear this all the time, but it's absolutely true because Lawler had had so many chances at the world title at that point between 74 and 77. They still were able to come back on December 18th, the week before Christmas and draw nearly 10,000 fans for the rematch. Uh, That tells me that Harley did his job. Uh, so I may, you know, maybe he's, you, you know, you think about the Lawler Funk feud that that's that's you know that spread and and has lasted forever, and they'll probably fight at the gates of hell. So, but really, Lawler and Funk only had two high-profile matches, and one of them did well, uh, in part because of the great build-up with Harley putting the King over, um, and then the rematch with Lawler and Funk only drew about six or seven thousand fans you know, which is, which was really poor. So uh, maybe Harley gets like the number three spot, but definitely, definitely unforgettable performer and uh, just super smooth in the ring. And he even made it, he, he's got the, uh, the notoriety of being the only man who made George Goulas look like a world beater uh, after the Jarrett uh, uh, Goulas split. Cause Harley came in there and worked a, a not a, not a 60 minute draw, but a 45 minute draw. <laughs> Because <laughs> they didn't think George could go sixty, <laughs> and uh, and I know I, I people have probably heard this story, but uh, Harley always chuckled when he told it, just because of Nick's reputation. But yeah, after the forty-five minute draw, Nick came up to Harley, was all excited, and practically kissed him on the cheek, saying, "You did it! You did it! You did that for Georgie! You did it for my boy!" 
here's a little something extra. Here's a little something for you. And he, and he gave him uh, $300, right? Uh, when Harley got his check, he looked on the thing and it was minus 300. So it was just like, <laughs> an, like, like it, it was just an advance. Uh, there, were, there was no bonus involved. Oh, me. Nick Goulas. Uh, and that's what's missing from 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 today's wrestling. You know these these characters, these these larger than life. They're not even really characters. Nobody ever used that word back in the day because you believed in these guys so much. And you know Memphis fans believed in Lawler being the king of Memphis, but I think they really believed in Harley being the king of the world because he was so good at what he did, and he was so sincere with that gruff rough around the edges promo that let you know this guy is not to be messed with. And I think that's Harley Race's legacy. A while back on the Super Podcast, John Hitchcock in his Front Row Section D segment told a really funny story about a night in Greensboro, North Carolina, where Magnum TA, the top young star for Crockett Promotions, was going against Harley Race. This is after Harley had lost the NWA title for the final time. Shortly before Harley Race would enter the World Wrestling Federation, he shows up in Greensboro for this match with Magnum TA. It's a funny story here. Let's go to this right now with John Hitchcock. We decided we had a small group, and we were sitting on the other side. This is before we finally got entrenched on the Section D. We were on the other side of the ring. And I made a sign that said, Fagnum PU. And simple sign, right? <laughs> Just a simple. It's not politically correct anymore to use those those no, terminologies. No, no. But Fagnum P U. You know, <laughs> it's Fagnum. Fagnum P U. And Magnum comes out, and you know we're hold, we're holding the sign up, we're booing the shit out of them, and everybody else is cheering him like crazy. And he's hot. He does. He is pissed off. And then lo and behold, who comes out to wrestling? But Harley Race. Now, Harley Race and Johnny Valentine had to have been the two toughest men who ever walked the planet. You know what I mean? I mean, they're tough guys. I mean, I've always thought Flair was a tough guy. I always thought, you know, because anybody that wrestled along as Flair, it had to be, you know, it's a miracle he didn't get hurt. But the legend was always Johnny Valentine and the great Harley Race. And Harley Race comes walking out. Harley Race sees the sign, and he kind of chuckles. And we start chanting, Harley. Harley, Harley, Harley. And we only got about five or six guys, but you know, as you can tell, I talk pretty loud. Well, they start the match and it's, it's a regular kind of give and take thing for a couple of minutes. And then it kind of gets weird and you go, this is different. And Harley starts whipping Magnum's ass. I mean, beating the shit out of him. And we're like, this is good. This is really good. We didn't expect this. We expected, you know, what we've been seeing on TV, 10, 15 seconds, belly to belly. And we're like, Harley Race ain't going to do no damn belly to belly like that. He's, he's, got, he's got principles. He's got pride. He's a legend. And you think I'm bullshitting. But he grabbed Magnum, threw him through the ropes. By the time Magnum hit the floor, Harley Race had already jumped out of the ring and was waiting on him, picked him up, full slammed him right in front of us, spit on him, and then said, <laughs> Read that sign, boy. <laughs> Swear to God. That's and I stand great. up and put the sign over him like, how's it going, Fagnum? <laughs> you suck. P you. <laughs> and Tommy Young is going, what the hell is going on? Because this isn't playing. You know, this is no plan. This is no book. You know, this is this shit's on. So they, they say it's a disqualification or something. So Harley starts to walk out, and we're chanting his name, Harley, Harley, you're the man. Then I said, you know what? I'm going to go after Magnum. I went, hey, Magnum, I thought you were a big deal in this town. Weren't they pushing you for the strap? Aren't you like the man? Aren't you like, you know, aren't you Dusty's boy? I said, Jesus Christ, you let that old man kick your fucking ass in Greensboro? In Greensboro? I thought this was your place. This was your place. This is big time. You let that old man kick your ass? Jesus, man. Magnum takes the bait, climbs in the ring, grabs the house mic, and he goes, and he goes, I swear to God, he goes, Race, you don't do that to me in Greensboro. Get your ass back out here and we'll settle it once and for all. We look at each other like, you got to be shitting me, right? He did, we just got fi finished seeing Magnum beat the fuck out of him. And here it goes. 
So you know the spot where the, the heel would step through the rope, the, the good guy would step through the ropes, the middle rope, and then the, the heel would attack him, you know, yeah. before he got through the ropes? Of course. That's what Magnum did to Harley. Harley was getting through the middle of the ropes, and Magnum attacked him and started throwing punches on his ass. I don't think this was work. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was kind of, a kind, you know what I mean? He's hitting him. And Harley throws a shoulder into Magnum, kind of staggers him back a little bit. Harley gets in the ring. The guy was quick, you know. He reaches up, hits Magnum in the, in the damn head with a punch, grabs him, and throws him over the top rope like a fucking Frisbee. Not grabbing the top rope and doing the flip. He's spinning sideways. I'm not shitting you. I've never seen anything like it. Sideways, and he crashes and burns right on the concrete. There was no pads back then. By the time, once again, by the time he was there, he hit the floor. Harley was on top of him. Harley grabbed him, hit him in the face with a punch, slammed his ass, spit on him, and said, if you want some more, get in the ring. Now, I'm one step away from beating off. You know what I mean? <laughs> He's like, holy shit, this is the greatest <laughs> shit ever. So we're all cheering, you know, Harley, Harley. And Magnum gets up, and he looks like a train wreck. I mean, he got, he got, he got thumped. And he, we're going, hey, why don't you ask him to get back in the ring? Come on, why don't you get some more of that? And Magnum's hot as shit. Of course, Kansas City has been a frequent topic here on this show. And whenever talking about the career of Harley Race, Harley wasn't just a top star there. He would end up owning a piece of the office. And one of the things you have to do when you own a piece of the office is make sure you have a booker. And Harley Race was responsible for finding a booker after Buck Robley left. And he found his man in the grappler, Len Denton. The grappler was on the 605 Super Podcast a little while back talking about this. Let's hear this right now. The grappler on Harley Race. After that 1983 run in Memphis, a short while after that, you end up having a very unique opportunity because you get a call from someone who had been your booker before, Buck Robley. And you mm -hmm. end up in Kansas City, which ends up really being an interesting run for you because mm. it's the first opportunity you get to be a booker. What was yeah. that experience like? Man, that was the best. I um, Well, it started out kind of crummy because, like you said, I went there. Robley and Brody were handling things, you know, uh, Bruce and Brody. And um, I got there because I was one of Robley's boys from Mid-South, you know, the grappler, you know. And so we get there and um, – Two weeks, all of a sudden, he takes off. And now here we are in Kansas City. <laughs> and I go, that's great, right? Buck quit, and, and Frank took off, went somewhere. <laughs> and yeah, and so here to leave, leave us here by ourselves. So um, I was in the Kansas City show. I forget. I think it was Saturday or Friday night. I forget when it ran. But um, all, all of a sudden, Harley Race, you know, him and Bob Guy go along, and Harley Race was part owner, right? And so Harley Race shows up at the show. And he was supposed to be in Japan, but he actually flew all the way home for one night to hire me as his booker. And I didn't realize this. And he got there and he comes in and he takes me in a room and he goes, Lenny, listen, you know, Robley's gone, this and that, but we need somebody to run this place. Somebody knows the business. And he said, I believe you can handle it. He said, would you like to be our booker? And coming from Harley Race, it was an honor. And I told him, and I said, Harley, you're asking me to be the booker for you in your territory. It'd be an honor, sir. He goes and gets Geigel, and he says, tell him what you told me. And I told Geigel, I told him it would be an honor to book for you guys. He goes, you got the job. But then as he goes, I'm flying back to Japan. <laughs> I'm flying back to Japan tomorrow to catch up with a tour. But he goes, and when I get back, you better have this place off his ass, boy. Hell, it all know. <laughs> what did I ask for? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was, but that was my first time. Thank God from Harley to get a chance to uh, to start booking, and, and I went on to be a booker just about everywhere I went after that. But and I learned a, so much of an education in doing it because when Harley come back, you know, we used to run um, St. Louis once a month, you know, and it was a joint show with Vern Gagne's crew and with uh, Fritz's crew out of World Class and with the Kansas City Boys, right? And so, but me and Harley, we booked it, and uh, we would handle all the finishes and stuff. So we sat together. And done this show together, me and Harley, every month. And we would, you know, it, it just it was one heck of a – you can imagine seven-time world champ, a hell of an education from this guy. And I learned a lot about handling this business from Harley Race. As Harley would probably tell the story, to make the grapple with the booker, I flew across God's green earth. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll tell you a good one. I'll tell you one. Talk about scare you. Harley Race could scare you. Okay. And um, this actually happened. Um, I was in, had been there booking for a while now, and they, it was in the summer, and they ran a show. It was a fair show, you know, and it's out, it was like 300 miles. I forget the name of the town. Long trip from Kansas City. So I get there, and I had to wrestle uh, the first match. I, and now I had to wrestle on a tag match because they had the card cut down to nothing. It was a fair show. It's guaranteed money. I think uh, Gaga was getting like ten grand for the show a year, you know, which is great money. But he only put like eight guys on the card. And so he had me wrestle once and then in a tag and then in a battle royal. <laughs> so so then um, the, mat, the show's over. And uh, they don't have no shower or anything. There's no place to take a shower. And I go, man, you got to be kidding. I mean, I wrestled three times, and I got to ride home for 300 miles steaking. Couldn't they afford to just get a room for us or something, you know, take a shower? Geigel pulls up. I was talking to Tony, and Geigel pulls up in his Cadillac, and he goes, hey, Lenny. He goes, do me a favor. He said, before they tear the ring down, the newscasters here from the local news, can you do an interview? I said, Bob. Is there anything else you want? You want me to wash dishes before I leave too? Or <laughs> he goes, get your ass up there and do that interview. I go, okay, okay, I got it. So I went to the ring, Brian, and I'm leaning against the apron and Tony's standing there. I said, let me get this promo, this interview out of the way, Tony, and we'll go. He's okay. So the newscaster guy leans to the ropes because, hey, Mr. Grappler, can I ask you for a favor? I go, what do you need? He goes, when I hit the call letters, when I hit the call letters on the station, can you pick me up like you're going to body slam me? And then turn my head toward the camera. Let me go. And I'll hit the call letters again. Say, hey, be here next year for the fair. It was a great time. This is so-and-so. We're out. And I go, that's fine. That's okay. I'll do it, bud. And he said, thank you. So he goes and starts his interview. And he goes like this, Brian. Well, folks, everybody had a good time at the fair. He goes, because wrestling's fake. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't say that word back then. You didn't use that the fake word back then. <laughs> Wrestling's fake, and uh, and I'm already pissed all the stuff I just went through. And he goes, because the fans know it ain't real, and the wrestlers know, and they're buddies. And he's he just laying it all out, right? And so I looked at Tony, a bump Tony, said, watch this, Tony. So when he hit the callers, I rolled in, I bellied the back him right on his head, suplexed him, knocked him out. Oh, <laughs> I grabbed him, I slapped the hell out of him. I got the mic, and I held him by the hair. I said, what'd you call wrestling, son? And I just let him go, right? So we go and we get in the car and we're taking off. We're leaving and I'm laughing. Hi, stop. Got some beer. We're on the way out of town. And I'm going, did you see that guy, Tony? I'm bragging it up. Right. And all of a sudden I got about beer too. And I stopped and I'm like, wait a minute. I probably just lost the fair date. And, uh, Bob Goggles could get a call before I get home tonight. And I said, Harley race is going to kill me for this. <laughs> and so, cause we shared an office together, right? The next morning, I had to be there at 8 o'clock, so I'm sitting in my office, and I got the door cracked, and I'm praying Harley don't show up. Sure as hell, I hear the door open, and, and I see a guy go by. I can see his briefcase. If you remember, Harley had a cowhide briefcase. I went, oh, man, Harley's here. So he goes back to the back where his big office was, and all of a sudden, I hear him go, Denton, get your ass in here. <laughs> so I go, man. So as soon as I got in there, I left the door kind of open. I go, Harley, before you start on me, let me explain myself. Please. He goes, and Harley's just got the squinted eyes. And he's smoking a cigarette and he's looking at me. He goes, you better have a good excuse because I heard what happened in that fair. And so I explained it to Harley exactly what the guy did. And you know what Harley said? He goes, next time, kid, break his arm or something or pull his eye out. Don't let nobody call wrestling fake. <laughs> that was his answer, Harley Race, just like Carl Cox. <laughs> yeah, who cares about the fair date? Yeah, no kidding, brother. <laughs> Harley was mad because I didn't beat the guy up worse. <laughs> Got to protect the business back in them days, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Mike, we've touched on various different areas of Harley Race's career, and in a moment we're going to talk a little bit about some of the feuds and some of the programs he worked in the 1980s, but I want to go to you because I know that you really have a soft spot in your heart for Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, and we're going to talk a little bit in a moment with John McAdam about some of the things Harley did, including the 1983 run with Ric Flair in Mid-Atlantic, but I'd like to get your impressions on that because it really is such an impactful angle, the Bob Orton turn on Ric Flair, you have Bob Orton and Dick Slater trying to collect the money, trying to put Ric Flair out of action. Harley Race wins the title back from Flair in the summer, holds it until Starcade. 
it's a real magical time of mid Atlantic wrestling. Oh yeah, absolutely. As a seven year old kid at the time, uh, who followed it not only on TV, but through the magazines as well, you know, this was heavy stuff that was going on and Jay Youngblood, Ricky Steamboat, Ric Flair, the triumphant uh, of my, of my childhood, the, the greats of my childhood and anybody that bucked up against them were of course, you know, evil in the enemy, whether it be Cronoodle and Slaughter or the Briscoes or of course, Harley race. And for me as a fan, Harley race is kind of like the ceremonial dividing line uh, for the Hulkamania kids. Uh, that era is, is what they would probably be primed uh, more known as like for us. And that being our big boom period, like Harley race was that dividing line. Like there was Ric Flair was taking the torch from Harley race. And that's what was happening in real life. But, you know, you didn't really realize it then, but as, as time goes on, you, you realize how, how important that period was and how much of a role Harley race played in it, passing that torch along. And to the victor goes the spoils uh, when it comes to telling the story of Ric Flair and his drive for Starcade 83, a flair for the gold, taking that title back from Harley Race. We always think of that story through mid-Atlantic eyes. And, and why should we not? It was a it was a redemption story for Ric Flair. It was a story of Harley Race not wanting to come around, saying he was done with Flair. Not only was he done with Flair, but he was putting up a bounty because that's how much he wants to get rid of Ric Flair. He's completely done with this man. And as all that's going on, what you find out later on, because I didn't live in Kansas City or St. Louis, that just months earlier, they were telling that same story about Ric Flair and Harley Race in that Ric Flair won't come around anymore. Harley Race can beat him. He beat him in the one fall in that best of three. The the one that went to a draw. He can still beat Ric Flair, but Ric Flair is too cowardly to come around. He doesn't want to come around here anymore. And, and as you look back, it's like, wow, they were actually telling the same story to basically pop two territories. You know, whether in Mid-Atlantic it was to build up Flair, but in St. Louis and Kansas City, it was to try to, to build up Harley Race again. And there was a lot that was going on at the time, and I'm not sure, you know, how much we're going to get into. But some of the stories that that, that you can trace back, thank God for Larry Matisik, because otherwise some of this stuff would be lost to time. In, in Harley's book, you know, he, he talks about why he wanted the title back and how St. Louis and Kansas City was was in flux because the WWF was was coming. That wasn't necessarily the case. A lot of that had to do with the fact that they were going to be involved in a small little war with Larry Matisik and the Greater St. Louis Wrestling Company, you know, and thankfully uh, there are other uh, uh, archivists of history as opposed to just Harley Race's biography, which is nice, you know, to get some nice stories in there and it's nice to hear from Harley, but was not exactly the hard hitting and, and, and depth producing piece of material that I think, you know, Scott Teal could have made it be. Yeah, I've actually heard a few people who write wrestling books say that that's the most disappointing one, only because you know the wealth of material inside of Harley's head. And for some reason, it did not translate into that book. It's too bad he didn't work with someone like Scott Teal, who would know how to really get that information out of him yeah. and get it onto the page. Unfortunately, that book is disappointing, the Harley Race biography. Yeah, and at least Scott could could ask the right questions. And there there was a good example there because WWF didn't go into Kansas City until July of the next year. It wasn't until July of 1984, and they didn't run there until September. I think it was September 29th was the, the date in 1984 where they actually ran there and did like 5,500. You know, it was not the, you know, not the quickest ascension there. What Harley had to deal with more was the fact that he was getting a little bit older. He did have a stake in both Kansas City and St. Louis, even though people didn't know that then. And he had to make plans for his future. And, you know, there there was the whole narrative in, in Kansas City and on their TV and on St. Louis TV that, like I said, Flair had been avoiding him for, for so long. And that, you know, the, the rules, if they could just bring him to Kansas City or into St. Louis again, then just – all the rules would be fair and he'd actually get a fair shake of this. And, and they, they obviously did this with Ric Flair, you know, on the flip side of that, when they were going to Greensboro for, for Starcade 83. But it was amazing that Flair won the title on September 17th, 1981. And on September 17th, 1982, Harley was defeating Dick the Bruiser <laughs> for his fourth Missouri title. Like, and if you hear Larry Matisik talk about it and recount the story, they knew what they were going to do in June around that time. 
Now, there were issues uh, from, as he's talked about, as far as how they got there, because Larry wanted Kerry Von Erich to be a threat. Harley was very reluctant to continue to lose to Kerry Von Erich and see Kerry Von Erich in a position of power because he had spent a good deal of time putting the Von Erichs over in St. Louis, whether it be Kevin, David, or Kerry. And he had a real concern as not only Larry, but other people have said it because Harley was very open about it. He didn't want to become, quote, Jack Briscoe in St. Louis, the old NWA champion, the old former legend who just constantly goes out there. And when it comes time to face the next big thing, always comes up a little bit short again. Didn't want to be the guy that that just did jobs. Very opposite of his his torch uh, passer, Ric Flair, uh, and, yeah. and for most of his career there. But, you know, it, everything started to kind of be built up then, and that's the story that they played, you know, and he, he had to, you know, conquer Jerry Blackwell, and he won his uh, another Missouri title, and that was, of course, the stepping stone to 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 get Ric Flair back into, into St. Louis, and he goes ahead and defeats him, and then we see a little bit of a flip around. The next month, Ric Flair wins the Missouri title. That keeps him in play in Missouri and Kansas City, as well as being able to tell the story over in Mid-Atlantic, that Harley, he got ripped off from a hometown decision. And, you know, there was a tour that was set up in All Japan. And everything for Starcade 83 was kind of set up before that All Japan tour took place. Dick Slater was suspended for pile driving Johnny Weaver on the floor. And so he, because he was going on the tour. Roddy Piper had his ear busted open by Greg Valentine. He can't hear anymore. He was on the tour. He went over. And the situation with Ric Flair who they did show have a couple of title defenses in Japan that they showed on Mid-Atlantic TV. But like all the pieces to Star Cave were kind of getting set around that time of the tour taking place. And then when it came back, it kind of opened up for the summer. And then we got what we got in Mid-Atlantic, you know, the, the St. Louis and Kansas City ter- uh, TV of that time. I'm not too familiar with as far as the build up to start how Starcade 83 went, but I certainly will remember how mid Atlantic's went. And it was obviously completely legendary because of Dick Slater, Bob Wharton Jr., Ric Flair, the aluminum bat and everything else that came with Harley Race's bounty. They broke records when Harley Race came back for the rematches. They did triple every city. There was that. You know, one of the things I do love and John McAdam talks a little bit about it here in the summer of 83, there's a Star Wars show for world class at Reunion Arena. Supposed to be Ric Flair versus Kevin Von Erich for the NWA title. Because Flair lost to Harley Race in St. Louis, Harley comes in now, and it's Kevin versus Harley, and it's not just some stranger. There is that long history between Harley Race and the Von Erichs. Harley Race is the world champion versus David versus Fritz, whoever it may be. So there is that history, and I do like that. I do. There is something I do like about the fact that they're building up the Flair match, and they have to switch it to Harley Race, but it's not like the fans there didn't know who he was. They still saw it as someone that the Von Erichs needed to get past. Absolutely. And that, you know, that stuff mattered, you know, on the mid Atlantic end of things, you know, with Flair losing, you know, and he comes back now, he had title matches set up with, with Harley race in, in mid Atlantic. And he also had matches set up with the United States champion, Greg Valentine, who the last time a lot of people in the area had saw Flair, you know, Flair and Valentine were splitting, you know, around early 83, they had teamed up against Steamboat and Youngblood and some other people, including Roddy Piper and, and Bob Orton uh, in late 82 and in early 83. So you had that connection. And, you know, it ended up being where, of course, you know, and as a fan, you pick up on this after a while, but it, but you accept it as a fan, too, that now that Flair lost the belt. Greg Valentine is beating him clean in the middle of the ring. But, you know, those matches that Flair was in with Valentine and that Flair was in with race, you know, once he had dropped the title in July were a huge boom for the, for the mid Atlantic territory. I mean, it was about triple the norm in every city is what Dave Meltzer had written. And if you watch mid Atlantic from that time, the good stuff was really good. The undercard stuff left a lot to be desired, and crowds at that time would leave a lot to be desired, too. It would end up atrophying much worse into 84, and the WWF raids and everything that came there, it really became noticeable and and very bad then. But this was at least a little bit of a lifeline and showed how big all that stuff was. And it was that time in the summer that they picked up all of the speed, you know, when it came to the, the, the TV and the bounty promo airing. 
and Flair beating Race in matches. You know, there were times where he beat Race in a dark match and they showed him getting pins and, and things like that that caused Harley to go nuts. You know, they would bring up the fact that Flair was ripped off over in, in St. Louis. You know, he didn't he got his shoulder up, but the but the ref only saw Harley's shoulder go up. And they played that angle up and they showed Ric Flair beating him on TV. In the same way they had Harley beat Flair on TV <laughs> or in, in St. Louis, and they'd always have that, you know, that win on film to prove that if everything was just if he got one more chance, Rick would be able to do it. And then Harley goes out there and, and, and throws all this stuff up in the way, throws up the bounty, wants to be done with Flair. And I mentioned Bob Orton, who teamed with Roddy Piper, you know, against Flair and Valentine at the end of 82. He had gone on a New Japan tour, so people hadn't seen him in Mid-Atlantic for almost around the same amount of time that they hadn't seen Flair or seen Slater or Valentine or anything. It was a little bit longer in that Bob Orton was also working Southwest, and he was working in St. Louis, and he was hanging around that area for a while. So, you know, he was gone for a little bit longer than those other guys, but when he came back in, all people could remember was Bob Orton was a good guy. And... As time went on, as the story started to get told, as people started to, to choose sides and some people would attack Flair looking for the money and we knew where Valentine stood, we knew where Gary Hart's guy stood, we knew where Paul Jones stood, but then Roddy Piper, Ricky Steamboat, other people started to stand up for Ric Flair and I'm Wahoo McDaniel, I got your back, Rick. And one of those people was Bob Orton. And they had a legendary interview and in, 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 you wouldn't have thought anything about it at the time. It was, I think, early September, early late August, early September, where there's Bob Orton and there's Roddy Piper and Ric Flair all standing there. And out, come Re, out comes David Flair and out comes Megan Flair. And there they are. They're the kids standing there. And Rick is so happy with his friends. And he knows when he's got family. It's more than just family. And there's Bob picks up David Flair in his arms and he's holding them. And that ended up becoming, obviously, later on down the line, one of the reasons that Ric Flair flipped out so much when Bob Orton turned on him. And, they, and he tried to collect that bounty alongside Dick Slater. And they spike pile drove Flair. And Harley Race just stood there and, and laughed and laughed and laughed. And one of the things Flair brought up was, you know, you hit me deep. You held my babies. <laughs> you held David. And you lied right to my face. And you tried to take the money and take me out. And you know, there are, there are so many nuances and nooks and crannies into that story that were so great. And some of it's up on the WWE Network. Some of the Mid-Atlantic stuff is up there. Not all of it is. They skip some weeks and things like that. And it's really hard to be able to tell that story without having access to, to worldwide wrestling, too. But there is just so much that's going on at that time in Mid-Atlantic. They start moving to remote shows. You know, they start start taping outside of the studios. And you see all that take place. You have the Briscoes and the, the Youngblood Steamboat feud continue on. And you have that weaving in with, with Flair and with Piper's feud with Valentine. And it was just, it was amazing TV. And it was just an amazing time. And, you know, long story short, none of that would have been uh, been able to have been done without Harley. Because of the, the again, you could not have done that with just Dusty Rhodes as, as the former champion or anything like that. It To me... That was one of those ones that you try to take somebody out and put them in Harley's place. Eh, Terry Funk, eh, Jack Briscoe, eh, I don't know. That, that just seemed to be, again, and because it, it went down so famous in history, maybe I can't imagine anybody else, but like if there was ever a, a great angle for Harley Race, like that's that's definitely what it was. And I think the fact that he came out of the womb looking like he was 55 years old kind of helped in that too. I mean, <laughs> I've smoked a lot of Newports and Camel Lights in my lifetime, and I, I could never get the rasp that he got. And he was just one of those dudes that was just like a Wahoo or a Ronnie Garvin. In my youth, I was scared of those types of dude. Jody Hamilton, the assassin. I did an interview with the assassin, and, and Harley Race was kind of like this, too. I was so intimidated when I did the show with Les Thatcher and Mike Mooneyham, and I had a chance to interview those guys. I had never been scared of a voice before. I was deathly afraid of talking to Jody Hamilton. And Harley Race, in some ways, was that intimidating as well, too, because I didn't want to make a fool of myself as well. But like Harley, that voice when I was little, that that just that nasty, mean heel of a person <laughs> you know you didn't have to be all jacked up the aesthetics all that nonsense or garbage you know that that you know a lot of people need uh needed to get over with harley just needed to be harley and that was scary enough and 
like as a kid too, I really did believe that he put Flair out of wrestling because that's another thing that they don't do very well in the WWE network. If somebody decides they want to go back and relive this, the way they play the interviews, a lot of what you're going to see out of it on that is out of order. They play interviews in the wrong spots. And because of that, you don't realize how long Ric Flair was actually out for. If you watch the TV, you would seem as though he announced his retirement and came back the next day, you know, in the same episode of the show because of the way they played these interviews and how they set things up. It wasn't like that. And as a fan, seeing Ric Flair being gone and what he was really doing at the time was going on a tour of Florida and going on a tour of Southeastern and going to Trinidad and Puerto Rico and defending the title down there. But in Mid-Atlantic, obviously, we didn't know this. We thought he was retiring. We thought he was hurt. He's on TV saying he's comparing this to his plane crash that, you know, nearly ended his life and ended his wrestling career. And he's got a choice to make. And that went on for a lot longer than what's shown on the WWE Network. And as a kid growing up and and people that were passionate about it, they really thought Ric Flair could be gone. And then obviously he comes back and they break all sorts of box office and closed circuit records when it comes to Starrcade 83. And the rest is literally history. Well, let's hear a little bit more about that history, both Starrcade 83, as well as the feuds with the Von Erichs, with Dusty Rhodes, as well as Harley Race eventually going to the World Wrestling Federation. Let's go now to this conversation I had with John McAdam, the host of Stick to Wrestling, with John McAdam and Sean Goodwin about Harley Race. We continue our look at Harley Race today here on the Super Podcast by speaking with a very popular guest here on the show, as well as the host of his own show, that being Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam and Sean Goodwin, a fine program right here on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Of course, I'm speaking about none other than Mr. John McAdam. John, thanks for being here today. Hey, thanks for inviting me, Brian. It's, a, it's sad circumstances, but here we are. We are going to talk about Harley Race. We're going to talk about some of the things he did in the 80s and around the last years of his NWA title reigns. I have to pluralize that. His title reigns. But before we get there, did you ever actually have an opportunity to meet Harley Race? I did very briefly once. It was kind of interesting. I was with a group of people in Baltimore uh, during the Great American Bash or right before the Great American Bash in 1991. And I am on an elevator with Harry White, who, you know, was Mr. Missouri. He was Mr. St. Louis. And we get off the elevator and who's getting on the elevator but Harley Race. And Harley and Harry knew each other. So it's kind of a weird moment. Like, okay, we're both, you know, thousands of miles away from where we live and here we are. So Harry says, oh, Harley, how are you doing? And they have a brief conversation. And I just shook Harley's hand. I'm like, you know, Mr. Race, it's an honor to shake your hand. You're a legend. What was weird about that is on our way back. Another guy in the group was Wade Keller. We're getting on the elevator, and Wade Keller's the same, uh, a Minneapolis guy. And who's getting off but Eric Bischoff? And we're all like, wow, they're bringing him in? And yeah, they're bringing him in, all right. <laughs> well, that's a whole other show yes. we can do to talk about that. But speaking about Harley Race, I said we're going to kind of talk about the early 1980s or even just the 1980s and Harley Race. But one of the things I wanted to speak to you about is Harley Race and the Von Erichs. Of course, the NWA champion was always going into Texas, always working for the Dallas booking office. It had been a mainstay in the NWA and would remain so until 1986. And Harley Race was no exception, had many, many title defenses in Texas. And eventually, starting in what, I think 1976, when Kevin Von Erich breaks in, the kids, one by one, Kevin, then David, then Kerry, they all break in, and very quickly, early in their careers, they start working with Harley Race, not just in Dallas, Texas. John, let's talk a little bit about this period of time where, once again, the Von Erichs are just breaking in, and they're going up against NWA champion Harley Race, who at that period of time is a veteran and, of course, the world heavyweight champion. What can you tell us about this? Well, I mean, all three Von Erichs got title shots, obviously not only in Dallas, but in St. Louis. Um, I remember I saw something, a match from 1979. It was a handicap match from St. Louis. It was Harley Race, then NWA champion, against Fritz Von Erich and David Von Erich in the handicap match. Well, Fritz takes a chair and sits down at ringside, Does is not part of the match. And of course, David Von Erich pins Harley Race, I believe, after a sleeper hold in the middle of the ring for this non-title match. And so uh, the nonsense with the Von Erichs and Harley Race got started kind of early. 
And at that period of time, David Von Erich wasn't the David Von Erich he would be in 1982 and 1983. He was very skinny and he was very young. David was a, was a really good athlete. He legitimately played football. He legitimately played basketball at North Texas State. But at this point in, in his career, he's green as grass. I mean, anyone else would be working prelims and learning the business because his dad's the promoter and has all this pull. David and Kevin and Carrie and Mike all got pushed really hard from the beginning. So to be honest, David in this match was was way out of his element. And Harley would be the first NWA champion willing to play ball with the Von Erichs. Of course, he was the first one to be champion when the kids started breaking in, but kind of set in motion a pattern of the NWA champion coming in, losing to the Von Erichs, but walking away with the NWA world championship, mostly in Dallas. Obviously, St. Louis, we got clean finishes. Yeah, well, I mean, when... Dory and Jack Dory Funk Jr. and Jack Briscoe were NWA champions. I mean, they had some embarrassing moments against Fritz, too. I mean, it, it got worse as time went on. I mean, you know, obviously you give something to the challenger in his hometown. That makes sense. But I felt right around the time Terry got the belt is when some of the offices started getting a little bit ridiculous, especially the Dallas office in terms of their treatment of the NWA champion in front of the fans. And Harley did have that stature. He was, of course, the champion, and he would come in there, and he would have these epic matches with David, with Kevin, and I think a lot of people still talk about the matches with Kerry, although David's really the one that he wrestled David right when David broke into the business. He wrestled David shortly before David died. So I feel like out of all the Von Erics, David and Harley are connected more than the other brothers. I would say yes, especially, I mean, they did the St. Louis angle, and then when Race was champion in 83, right, as a matter of fact, right around the time he first won the belt, they did the Star Wars in uh, Dallas. It was supposed to be Kevin against Ric Flair, but instead it's Kevin against Harley Race. Kevin injures his shoulder during the match. David comes to ringside. Of course, it turns into a schmoz, and David knocks Harley Race out, the NWA champion, throws the belt on top of his chest and starts, you know, uh, giving him a verbal beatdown, you know, while Race is defenseless. And even as a kid, I'm like, yo, come on, this is the NWA champion. This is over the top. Well, let's go a few years earlier. I actually just found a program, June 20th, 1978, the Sportatorium in Dallas, Texas. Big time wrestling. Ed Watt, the matchmaker. This is the night of a rematch. David Von Erich challenges world champ Harley Race. Again, this is June 1978. David is a picture of him here, young and skinny. This rematch is happening because the match the previous week ended. Harley Race in the sleeper hold as the bell rung, keeps the title, but obviously makes David look very, very strong. And this program actually has the results written in it. It's one of those programs that was traded around, and the person mm. who traded it would write in the results. And if I look in here, David Von Erich versus Harley Race, it appears to say every Von Erich family member entered in this match. Harley Race won via DQ, keeping the title. It must have gotten a huge pop when Doris hit Harley with her purse. I don't know if it was Doris per se, but <laughs> maybe it was every other family member that hit the ring. <laughs> Nothing surprises me with the Von Erichs. We were talking about how Carrie was still in high school. Did Kerry get involved? I mean, uh, who was it? The really little one, Chris Von Erich, got involved in the hair match in 1985, so why not? Well, you know, speaking of outdoor stadium shows in world class, of course, the Fritz Von Erich retirement show happens at Texas Stadium. It's not the crowd that would be there for the Parade of Champions. Still a good crowd to see Fritz Von Erich retire, his match with King Kong Bundy. But there was another big match on that show, and once again, showed the stature of Harley Race that he was brought in for this role this night. Oh, yeah. I mean, I to this day, I always wonder why Ric Flair was not on that show. Um, I don't know if, if he was in Japan or something. Why not just book it at another time? But, yeah, you've got Harley Race um, as part of the co-main event, uh, number one contenders match with Kerry. And, it, I mean, it drew fairly well. I mean, it, look, it doesn't look good because it's a football stadium with 7,000 people in it. But 7,000, yeah, that's not bad at all. Not at all. And, of course... Harley would return, like you said before, 1983 as the NWA champion. Originally, the match was set up where Ric Flair was going to come in. Ric Flair loses the title to Harley Race. Harley comes in, and because the fans already know who he is, they already know his history, they're already set up for that. But mm -hmm. 
Speaking of this period of time, 1983, he does get the title back from Ric Flair. And that, of course, leads to some stuff in Mid-Atlantic. Talk a little bit about Harley Race's role in not just building up the first Starcade. Obviously, he's in the main event, but just how good he was in that role as being the champion. And a babyface Ric Flair is doing everything he can to get the Harley Race. That might have been my favorite thing of Harley Race's career when he put a $25,000 bounty on Ric Flair because he's, he's so scared that Flair's going to win the title back from him. And I thought he did his most effective promos. He was very cold, calculating. You know, it, it was almost like it wasn't personal, Rick. I just need you out of the way so I don't lose this title. And of course, uh, you know, Bob Orton Jr. winds up turning on his friend Ric Flair and setting up Starcade 83. And it was such a big deal, a flare for the gold, of course. It was the big event that came out of the success that Slaughter and Kernodal versus Steamboat and Youngblood had had earlier in the year. They start planning for this event. That's really why the title change happens. I mean, there was no plan for Harley to get another title change. It was to set up this event. It was, and I read Harley's book. I was actually looking for it last week, and I couldn't find it. I read his book like 15 years ago, and in the book, he expressed uh, he was pretty mad that they took the title off of him and never put it back on him again. And I was a little bit taken aback by that because, you know, Harley had a really nice run on top that lasted a while, and it was time for something else by Starcade 83. And of course, one of the famous stories that Vince McMahon shortly before Starcade 83 offered Harley Race a large sum of money to no show mm-hmm. Starcade and instead come to Madison Square Garden where he would drop the world title and would probably lose the NWA affiliation as soon as Harley no showed Starcade. But the Harley Race World Championship would have been dropped, probably merged into the WWF World Championship in a match against Hulk Hogan. That was the plan. And, uh, yeah, that's what I've heard over the years. And, you know, the one word that you always hear applied to Harley Race is respect. Um, and what this, what you just talked about, Harley Race, you know, not just jumping to Vince McMahon, jumping to the WWF, no showing Starcade, is one of those reasons why Harley was so respected in the business. And, you know, when he talked about it. He's like, you know, according to Harley, he and Vince McMahon were in the bathroom and Harley told Vince, look in that mirror. And Harley's like, you know, I have to look in the mirror every day, which is why I can't do this for you. Of course, Harley, at this period of time, was a partner in an NWA promotion, not just a longtime champion and a longtime drawing card, but an owner in the Kansas City office. He also owned a piece of the St. Louis office. So he's Mr. NWA around this period of time, and he's right there on the front lines as this battle is happening between Vince McMahon and every established wrestling promoter. And that's why it was still somewhat shocking that he would end up going there just a couple of years later in 1986. Yeah, um, right before that, he did an angle on World Championship Wrestling where he got involved in the match between Magnum TA and the Barbarian and you know wound up laying Magnum out. And you're th- I'm thinking, OK, well, here comes the big feud against Magnum TA and we never saw him again. And a couple of months later, I want to say March, April of 1986, he's in the WWF, which was one of the biggest surprises to me of all of the WWF acquisitions. Yeah, they bring him in. First, he's handsome Harley Race. He very quickly becomes the King Harley Race. Of course, we we talked a little bit earlier uh, with Scott Bowden about what that would mean in Memphis, where Mm -hmm. Jerry Lawler was the king. But one of the things they do is they put him in a feud with Junkyard Dog, and they were really trying to hide the Junkyard Dog's weaknesses, if you think about it, by putting him in there either in tag team matches or against guys known for being excellent wrestlers, whether it was Terry Funk or shortly after that, Harley Race. Uh, yeah, and if you think about Harley in the WWF, I mean, who were his main feuds? Uh, Junkyard Dog, who couldn't go anymore. Hacksaw Jim Duggan, who could not go anymore. Ultimate Warrior, who could never go. I mean, Harley really went out there, and, oh, and he had excellent matches against Hulk Hogan in Boston and New York. I mean, he was a guy that if you needed to get a good match out of a corpse, he could do it. And of course, it would be one of those matches with Hulk Hogan where he would sustain an injury, which I guess we could say ended his career, although it seemed like he was getting towards the end anyway. It did. I remember that match on Saturday Night's main event and hearing before it that Harley had suffered a significant injury that might have ended his career during it. Yeah, he was almost 50 at that time. He would make a comeback from that injury and then would leave the World Wrestling Federation, make a couple of appearances in different places like Calgary. 
He even had a match with Tommy Rich at Great American Bash 1990. That's uh, an interesting thing to think about considering where those two guys were in 1981. And here they were oh, yeah. in 1990. Very different points in their career having this match. He would then retire and become a manager. What did you think of Harley Race as a manager for either Lex Luger or I guess we could say Mr. Hughes and then probably most known for being the manager of Vader? Well, Harley, let me throw this in. In 1990, there was talk of bringing in the tag team of Harley Race and Buzz Sawyer um, and to feud them with the Steiners. And it, obviously it never happened. And my take was, look, I know Harley is just about the toughest guy in, in the world, but the Steiners didn't play nice. And I think he was 48 at that time. And I didn't think it was a good idea. And I'm kind of glad it didn't happen because I wanted to see the Steiners against the Midnights anyway. But yeah, I was there in 1990. One that you know weird moment when Harley Race and um, Mr. Hughes were walking down the ramp in Baltimore. It's like, oh, that's what Harley's doing here. So yeah, he was best managed, known for managing Vader. I thought he did a really good job. I wasn't crazy about the idea at first, but as it unfolded, I really liked it, and I thought those two meshed really well together. You know, John. One other thing I did want to ask you about, and I forgot to mention it earlier, but when we're talking about some of the places that Harley went in the 1980s during the last years as NWA champion, some of the guys he wrestled against, whether it's the Von Erichs or whether it's Ric Flair. He, of course, did come into New York and have a match at Madison Square Garden against Bob Backlund. What do you remember about that being a Northeast guy? I remember this. Um, the Shea Stadium show, I think, was August 8th, 1980. Um, and then the next television that we watched, now that was a Saturday. So a week later, they announced the upcoming Madison Square Garden show with Bob Backlund against Harley Race. And the way Vince McMahon described it, he's like, OK, there are different leagues in uh, in sports, for example, you have the NHL and the WHA. You have the NFL and the World Football League. You have the NBA and the ABA. In wrestling, we have the WWF and the NWA. And he described Harley Race as being the NWA champion. And he's coming in on September 22nd, 1980, and we're going to unify the belts. And even even then, I knew they were not <laughs> unifying the belts, but I, I got to see the match. It's on WWE Network. I thought it was absolutely terrible, but I do remember the buildup, and it sold out, so it, it got over, obviously. You know, one last name I do want to ask you about here, John, before we wrap things up. So many people think of Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair, but to me, it's Dusty Rhodes chasing after Harley Race. That is the best Dusty Rhodes. And you can say that about a lot of guys, Tommy Rich chasing after Harley Race. You can say it about a lot of guys, but it's Dusty trying to get that title for Harley Race that means so much. What can you tell us? What can you tell us about Dusty Rhodes and his multiple tries at the title, the times he did get the title, and Harley Race and Dusty overall? I mean, here's the thing. I did not like the way Harley Race or the NWA champion was booked in Dallas because you had to protect him against, you know, you had to protect Kerry, you had to protect Kevin, you had to protect David. It was a little bit too much, like all three of them. But in, in Florida, they, they only really protected Dusty. Like Harley Race would lose to Jack Briscoe. He would actually be Jack Briscoe would lose to Harley Race. Steve Kern would lose to Harley Race, etc. So, yeah, I actually agree with you that Dusty was Harley Race's best challenger. Um, I was talking to Brian off the air. I got Florida Wrestling on cable in 1980, and they had the uh, the last tangle in Tampa where Dusty promised that if he did not take the NWA title from Race, uh, he was never going to challenge for the NWA title again. So if I'm a fan watching that on TV, I was a fan watching that on TV. I'm like, oh, the title's changing. And if I live anywhere near Tampa, I'm going to see that title change. And of course, it didn't happen. But but Dusty would win the title from Harley Race. And of course, every time got a major reaction and there was always a camera right there to film the whole thing. Fans jumping up and down usually wanted to be a part of Dusty's celebration because they had seen him chase after Harley Race for so long. And it was in Atlanta. It wasn't even his home base. And I've seen the match plenty of times. The crowd goes absolutely ballistic. Brian, may I share something with you and your listeners regarding Harley Race? Please. Oh, I before the show, we were going to we said we were going to talk about St. Louis a little bit. What I would give to have grown up in or around St. Louis 
and see these matches. These are all the, the wrestlers Harley Race took on just in the city of St. Louis. Pat O'Connor, Edouard Comprantier, Wilbur Snyder, Dick the Bruiser, Dory Funk Jr., Terry Funk, Johnny Valentine, Jack Briscoe, Gene Kaniski, Bruno Sammartino, Billy Robinson, Bobo Brazil, Terry Funk, Rocky Johnson, Sailor Art Thomas, Bob Backlund, Superstar Billy Graham, Ernie Ladd, Dick Murdoch, Ric Flair, Ted DiBiase, all three Von Erichs. Ken Patera, Butch Reed, Rick Martell, Giant Baba, Hulk Hogan in 1983 got a title shot against against Harley Race and Wahoo McDaniel. That's a heck of a list. I would I would love living in St. Louis to see that, even though I know I would have gotten the Clark Griswold treatment. Well, Clark, we have looked at so many different territories and wrestlers rather quickly here in this segment. How would you sum up Harley Race as the NWA champion? You've seen so many different champions, both on tape, on TV, and in person. What do you think of Harley Race as world champion? Well, let me say this. Terry Funk was voted in the NWA champion sometime in 1975. Supposedly, he barely won the vote over Harley Race. When Terry decided about a year into it, he didn't want to do it anymore. There was barely any conversation. Race was getting a a real run with the belt this time. And I thought his first, his second title reign, well, his title reign that basically went from 77 to 81 was a little bit long, but he was the perfect NWA champion. I mean, he was great. He was great on interviews. He could wrestle. He was a believable. He was a little bit colorless, but in a way that worked to his favor because he came across not as like a flamboyant pro wrestler type. He came across as a legit wrestler, a legit badass. He didn't need a gimmick. Well, there you hear it, John McAdam, and that is the final conversation we have this week here on this special Harley Race tribute episode of the 605 Super Podcast. Of course, there was so much more we could have talked about here today, whether it was Harley in Florida, Harley in St. Louis, Harley in Japan, but that will have to wait for a future episode of the 605 Super Podcast, where hopefully we could do more of a focus on Harley in various different places. But Mike, as we wrap things up, how do you think Harley should be remembered? What's the legacy of handsome Harley Race? He is pro wrestling. He really, really is pro wrestling. And he really is the dividing line. He is the Mason Dixon line of the era. And I know he bled over into the WWF. And I think there are some people, and I understand that they wanted to make him the court jester. They thought what they were doing with Harley Race as the king was a joke. But I think for those people that never saw Harley and don't look at wrestling so with such a critical eye, they had a chance to see him do some fun things with Junkyard Dog and with Hacksaw Duggan and with Haku. And I don't think anybody should really look too down upon that. And you certainly can't hold that against a man that could honestly be on pro wrestling's Mount Rushmore because no one took the professional wrestling business as seriously as Harley Race. And in professional wrestling, you had to look out for number one. That was you. That was yourself. And Harley Race did an amazing job of that, too. So Harley Race is the definitive professional wrestler. Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk Jr., Lou Fez, there's a a million guys that you can call and make a case for. But I think if you wanted to start with somebody with the intestinal fortitude and with everything that came along with the whole package, if you wanted to create a wrestler a pro wrestler, especially one of a, of a certain era. I, I think you, you start with Harley Race. Well, Mike, as we wrap things up, we want to thank everyone for listening to this episode of the 605 Super Podcast, this special edition, looking at the life and career of Harley Race. Of course, if you want to stay in touch with the show on Twitter at 605pod, Facebook, facebook.com slash superpodcast. And until next time, with episode 100 of the 605 Super Podcast, For Mike Sempervivi, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!